Shall we go? Yes. Uh, Ma'am, just a minute. Uh, PR people will join live, so we are just waiting. Just a couple of minutes. Just a couple of minutes. Yeah, ma'am. We are live now. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Shreyasvi. Did you know, historically speaking, the twenties have usually witnessed a pandemic. Say, the year seventeen twenty saw the Great Plague of Marseille in France. Eighteen twenty witnessed the first Asiatic cholera pandemic. This was known to have been have begun close home in the city of Calcutta. The Spanish flu, one of the deadliest influenza pandemics. humanity has ever witnessed prevailed during the year 1920 and this 2020 saw the corona pand corona virus pandemic or the covid 19 pandemic as we know it that was something i didn't know anuja however i feel blessed to be dealing with the pandemic during the era of technology it's impossible to even imagine the state we'd have been in if this pandemic had hit us even a few years ago and the way the situation has pushed innovators to create more to help people is also something we can consider a silver lining i mean look at the increased utilization of technology in the field of healthcare now accessibility was a big issue but now with the advent of virtual consulting telemedicine fitness apps etc it's become a lot more convenient for people to access healthcare services you make a compelling argument shreyasvi Nonetheless, my future kids will still get the I survived the pandemic during my education. Motivational lecture. Moving on, I would like to remind everyone to please ensure that the mics are on mute. Good evening to one and all present. Today, my colleague Dr. Anuja Jambale and I, Shreya Sri Verma, on behalf of MBA Healthcare Management Program of KJ Somaya Institute of Management, welcome you all to the inaugural ceremony of our first ever international healthcare management conference. with our scientific knowledge partners helis sekseria institute for public health and kj somaya medical college hospital and research center we are very proud of the doctors nurses and medical staff of our very own somaya medical college hospital and research center who admirably rose to the challenge that the pandemic put forth and created medical facilities in the form of increased beds ventilators and icus in a commendably short period of time Today's event will be conducted in two sessions. The first session being the keynote address by Dr. Samir Mitragotri, and the second session, which will comprise of our panel discussion, moderated by Dr. Pramod Prabhakaran. Due to the pandemic, all of us have been confined to our homes. It's not just halted us at micro levels, but also the whole economy at the macro level. Every industry has been dealt with a blow that they're slowly recuperating from. In this situation. one industry that's responsible for being our frontline defense against the coronavirus is the healthcare industry our frontline covid warriors have done exemplary work in ensuring the health and safety of the people indeed however like you mentioned earlier technology has kept us all connected to each other we not only attend classes with much ease but today are also capable of host, hosting such a big event and we are also able to have in our audience people from around the world such as thailand uk malaysia usa and netherlands this conference aims to bring an amalgamation of academicians healthcare students industry practitioners leading academic scientists researchers and research scholars to exchange and their experience and share their experiences and the research findings on possible aspects of what is also the theme of this year's event the future of healthcare post covid 19 we believe an auspicious event should always begin by attaining god's blessing professor rekha uh, professor rekha bairwarasu will recite the prayer so i request you all to kindly join your hands and rise thank you shreyas om purnamada पूर्णमीद पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्ण से पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवा वशिष्य 
ईशावस्यदिच जगत्याम जगत तेन त्यक्तेन भुंजीथा मृध कस्वन मूक कौति वाचाल पंगु लंगयते गिरि यत्तम वंदे परमानंदमाधव प्रणोदेवी सरस्वती वाजे भिर्वाजिनीवती धीना अवित्रवतु चोदयित्री शुण्रूता चेतंती सुमतीना यम दधे सरस्वती ओ असतो मद्गमय तमसो म्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय ओ सहनावत सहनौ भुन सह वीर करवाह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मिषावह सुखिन सन्तु सर्वे सन्तु निरामया सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कचिदुखमाया ओ शाति 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 Thank you, ma'am. Request you all to please take your seats. Sir, sir, it's my honor to introduce Dr. V. N. Rajasekhar and Pillai, sir, Vice Chancellor of Somaya Vidya Vihar University. Professor Pillai has been at the helm of affairs of many higher educational and scientific research establishments, such as Vice Chancellor of the Indira Gandhi National Open University. executive director of the national assessment and accreditation council as well as vice chairmanship and chairmanship of ugc among many others i welcome dr v n rajasekharan pillai sir for the opening remarks thank you very much first of all let me welcome the keynote speaker and all the distinguished participants from all over the world attending the first international healthcare management conference organized by the KJ Somaiya Institute of Management of the Somaiya Vidya Vikas University uh, our institution has been in the forefront of education and healthcare if you just look at the names of the two campuses uh, which we have envisioned our our founders have envisioned it is uh, vidya vikar and ayur vikar of course there is no need of uh, explaining the meanings of these two words from looking at education and health and i am glad that a premier management institution in the country one of the top ranking management institution in the country is organizing this international uh, conference on healthcare management uh, and it is also very pertinent to note that the first international conference on healthcare management comes uh, in a period where we have faced unprecedented challenges in the healthcare sector whether it be in managing healthcare in a in a country so diverse as ours we have seen the type of management of course uh, we we are really good compared to many other so called developed countries in managing the pandemic pandemic several states have evolved their own ways of looking at the pandemic and then responding to the challenges in a very positive way 
I think we have re we have uh, we have succeeded as a country. We have succeeded in managing uh, the the COVID situation compared to many other countries. So, of course, uh, comparing to other countries is it's totally different for India. It is totally different. Looking at the population, looking at the di diversity, and all these things, and then we could see that. Uh, we have been managing we have been managing the covid we have been managing the healthcare in a very significant way by making use of technology uh, for the last several months many of us uh, have not even seen a doctor many of us many of most of us have not even seen a doctor we have seen we have seen the we have, we have been teaching telemedicine uh, in the Indian Space Research Organization, several years, several decades ago, started telemedicine, telemedicine in the country. Telemedicine has been in, in practice, but now we see whether it be in the Ayurvedic healthcare, whether it be in the mod modern medicine healthcare, all in these areas, uh, be it in traditional healthcare management systems, we are using technology in a very significant way. So, uh, with the advent of, with the appropriate use of technology, we are contacting doctors, we are contacting health institutions, we are networking with each other and then sharing the, I mean, uh, sharing the experiences, maybe sharing the agony and the ecstasy of managing institutions, uh, managing healthcare, uh, state-wise, uh, state country-wide, institution-wise, uh, education institution-wise, industry, all these people, how they were managing uh, the situation in a very significant way. We have a lot of case studies, maybe several hundreds of case studies of uh, understanding healthcare management systems in a very significant way. And this, of course, this gave us a lot of, oppor lot of opportunities for each and every one of us to look at uh, the manage management aspects, technological aspects, and the healthcare aspects in a very significant way. I am sure that this particular conference and also which is being organized by the healthcare management program division of the KJ Somaya Institute of Management will go a long way in understanding uh, the uh, understanding uh, the success stories. Maybe we will give us a lot of tools for, for, for managing our healthcare in a, a much more effective way. We are, we can, uh, I'm an incorrigible optimist. I sincerely believe that the type of experience which we had individually and collectively that will go a long way in uh, in managing health uh, managing diseases managing ep epidemics in a significant way uh, let me wish the program all success let me once again uh, welcome all the distinguished participants for this conference i am sure that the proceedings of this conference the uh, takeaways from this conference will be useful not only to the management institution in the entire healthcare systems, uh, both in the public and uh, private sector uh, healthcare management systems in the whole country. Let me wish you all the very best, a happy and prosperous new year to each and every one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Today, we have amongst us our respected director, KJ Sumaya Institute of Management and Dean Faculty of Management Studies, Sumaya Vidya Vihar University, Dr. Monica Khanna Ma'am. Monica Ma'am is an experienced academician and a professional with around 28 years of experience in academic teaching, research, and industry. She's been a visiting faculty at various international and national institutions. Prior to joining academia, she worked with Siemens in the areas of engineering and industrial automation. Ma'am has also won several awards in her field of expertise, the most recent being the YK Bhushan Award for 100 Most Dedicated Teachers of India. I now request Ma'am to please deliver the welcome address. Uh, Monica, ma'am, you are you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, you have to unmute unmute yourself. <coughs> okay, thank you. A very warm welcome to all the esteemed guests present here. Indeed, it is my very proud privilege to welcome all the guests here 
for the inaugural ceremony of the first international healthcare management uh, conference. In fact, this is the first edition of the International Healthcare Management Conference, and it is being conducted by the MBA in Healthcare Management faculty and students under the banner of the Somaya Vidya Vihar University. I would like to place on record my great compliments to the faculty and staff of the healthcare management program and the students, of course, for their persistent efforts in putting this conference together with such an illustrious list of speakers from across the globe. I'm very happy to inform all of you that the Institute has evolved over the past four decades as offering domain-specific and sector-specific and multidisciplinary MBA programs. In fact, with respect to the MBA in healthcare management, the Institute conducted a market research in the year 2016 to find out the feasibility of launching a full-time MBA program in healthcare management. After due diligence, the MBA in healthcare management was launched in the year 2018 with 30 seats in academic partnership with the KJ Somaya Hospital and Medical Research Center, Mumbai, and the Imperial College Health Partners in London, UK. There have been unforeseen disruptions in the healthcare environment due to the global pandemic, bringing out the strengths and the challenges of the various healthcare systems in different parts of the world. Indeed, the need of the hour in healthcare management is developing new knowledge, new skill sets, new mindsets, and new behavior patterns for all the stakeholders in the healthcare system. The focus on the use of digital and analytical abilities along with the out-of-box thinking is what is requirement at the moment. Inculcating such attributes requires professional training. An MBA in healthcare management fills this very gap between scientific medical knowledge and management skills. The, th the conference theme on the future of healthcare post COVID-19 is very appropriate and the illustrious panel of speakers will help us to plan our thoughts and execute our strategies. I thank each one of you for joining us here today and look forward to very thought provoking discussions. I welcome you all once again for this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. There's a feeling of amazement that rushes through me, and I feel honored to introduce our inspirational keynote speaker, Dr. Samir Mitragotri, sir. Dr. Samir Mitragotri is an Indian-American professor at Harvard University, an inventor, an entrepreneur, and a researcher in the fields of drug delivery and biomaterials. He's currently the Hiller Professor of Bioengineering and Hansio Vice Professor of Biologically Inspired Engineering at Howard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and the Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. He's widely recognized for his contributions to the field of drug delivery and is considered a pioneer of many novel drug delivery technologies, especially in the fields of transdermal, oral, and targeted systems. Dr. Mitragotri has published over 230 publications and has given over 500 presentations worldwide and is an inventor of over 160 patents and applications. He is a co-founder of several companies that are developing products based on his inventions. So it is an immense pleasure to be able to host you today. We eagerly look forward to your address on emerging technologies and innovations to overcome global challenges. We will be holding a question and answer session after Sir's address. In the meantime, please send in your queries via the chat box to the keynote address POC, Mahima Khandelwal. The stage is yours now, Sir. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you so much for the invitation to present today. Uh, can I share my screen? Sure, sir. So now I want to congratulate you and the institution for this, uh, you know, remarkable accomplishment. I think the education at the uh, uh, interface of management and health—that's uh, the emerging need of the future. 
and I really appreciate and recognize for you taking the initiative to put together this program and holding this conference. Can everyone see my screen? Great. Yes, sir. So uh, what I would like to do today is really have a conversation with uh, all the participants. Uh, you know, I see a number of dignitaries, uh, a number of students in the audience who have thought about uh, interface of health and management and may have their own perspective on this topic. What I would like to do is share some of my thoughts and uh, answer questions and have a discussion around this topic. Um, I am a technologist. I'm an engineer, a chemical engineer by training working in the field of health and medicine. And you may wonder, what is an engineer doing in the field of health? And the basic reason uh, is that technology has already made an enormous impact on health, all aspects of health, including how drugs are discovered, which drugs are discovered, how they are given to the patients and how the patient's overall health is monitored. And moving forward, it's gonna be an even more impacting contribution of technology to the medicine to a point where I would say the future of health and medicine is gonna be driven by the innovation coming from the technology. So it's really an opportune time to think about this interface. And opportune in a very, odd way uh, because as we all know, COVID has really taken a toll on the society, uh, especially in the US. Uh, yesterday was, I believe, one of the deadliest days. About 4,000 people lost their lives to COVID. And at a time like this, uh, we have to take a step back and look at not only COVID, but the overall health and how we are managing health of the patient and how will it impact going forward. So that's what I would like to do. Um, think about some of these topics and uh, uh, you know, see what kind of changes we might be thinking about, what kind of problems we're gonna face in the future and how technology might come to the help uh, to address these problems. So let's take a step back. And you know, when you think about health, uh, what are some of the challenges that we are facing and we will face? And there are many ways of looking at that. And probably I would say one of the simpler ways to look at this is to ask ourselves, what diseases are killing people? Uh, this data is from 2017. Um, things haven't dramatically changed in terms of this particular number over the last three years. And if you look at the worldwide uh, cause of deaths, uh, the number one uh, killer disease uh, is cardiovascular disease heart attacks, uh, killing you know, a vast majority of the people. And this number is increasing, uh, especially uh, in high income countries. Uh, as the lifestyle is changing, it is taking a toll on the cardiovascular health of the population. So we're gonna have to keep an eye on this moving forward. Number two is cancer. And tremendous progress has been made in treating cancer over the last decade over the last few years in particular, but cancer to a large approximation is a disease of the age. There is a correlation in the prevalence of cancer with age. And as a society ages, the prevalence of cancer is also becoming important. Some cancers have been tackled very well. Uh, breast cancer, for example, has had uh, enormous success in, some, in terms of the treatment over the last few years, but others like pancreatic cancer, uh, is still a largely unaddressed problem. So, you know, as a, if we look at the entire society, this is one disease that we're gonna have to watch out for. Probably in the, in the uh, light of COVID, number three and number four are very peculiar. Uh, respiratory diseases, in the absence of COVID, this was emphysema, uh, COPD, and other lung-related diseases, uh, but the respiratory infections, uh, as it is, they were responsible for a lot of deaths. 
uh, influenza and other infections and COVID has single-handedly impacted this number dramatically. And moving forward, uh, how this is going to be addressed is going to be an important problem. Dementia. And I would like to call this out in particular uh, because as the society ages, dementia has been on tremendous rise over the last few years. Alzheimer's is number one in that list. And there is still no good treatment for the Alzheimer's disease. And we're gonna to have to watch out for this and figure out how we're gonna treat this moving forward. I won't go through the entire list. Uh, there are some other familiar names. Uh, and some unexpected names. For example, diarrheal diseases is way up there uh, you know, in the top 10. And this is obviously not happening in high income countries, but in the low income countries, diarrhea is causing a lot of deaths. And that's gonna be a very, to me, that's a very startling number, right? On one hand, we are talking about technology and, you know, developing all kinds of new therapies to treat patients. And on the other hand, we're talking about something as simple in many ways as diarrhea killing people, and that's happening in a lot of low-income countries. So when it comes to health disparity, this is something we're gonna to have to really keep in mind. How do we deliver health, not only to individuals in high-income countries or not in this part of the society, which has high income, but also make sure that the entire population of the globe gets access to essential health. Uh, diabetes uh, is, a, is a very familiar name in there, especially uh, on the rise in the Asian countries uh, because of the sudden change in lifestyle over the last decade or two. Uh, and diabetes doesn't kill people immediately, but if left uncontrolled over a period of time, it is responsible for a lot of deaths. Trauma is an important part of uh, is a, is a big reason for deaths uh, listed here as road injury. And this is interesting because I see in the audience uh, a lot of uh, young individuals below the age of 45. Um, and in that part of the society, the number one killer is trauma. And in trauma, what kills people is the blood loss. When, when accident happens, before you can get the patient to the hospital, there is so much blood loss that the patient dies on the spot. So if you look at these challenges, there is a huge variety. There's a spectrum. Talk starting with something as trivial, I would call it in, 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 the, in the medical terms as diarrhea, all the way to cancer and blood loss. And what I would like to, uh, all of us to think about how is technology going to help address this. Now, when you say technology, um, probably different things come to people's mind. Um, technology in the sense of getting the medicine to the patient. Technology in terms of communi communicating with the patient. What I'm going to talk about in my talk is a bit upstream. Technology in the sense of how do we develop new medicines? Uh, what kind of things have been working in the past and what kind of medicine we are thinking about in the future so that the tools that the doctors have are 10 years, let's say 10 years from now, 20 years from now, can they be very different than the tools that they have today? So let's think about the, the drugs that we're going to be using to treat this. Now, regardless of what disease you're talking about, regardless of what drug you're talking about, this is the way the drug is developed. This is the process of drug development. And what you see here on the y-axis is the time in years, going from zero all the way up to 12 years. When a company develops the drug, you start with lots of drug candidates, right? So these, these diseases like cancer and others or Alzheimer's, it's not clear exactly which medicine is gonna be effective. And in the absence of that knowledge, a typical drug company starts with tens of thousands of potential molecules which can become drugs and systematically takes them through experimentation. Starting with experiment in the lab, then taking some of them to experiments in small animals. Mice are very typical when you start developing the drug. Then taking some of them five to 10 and doing clinical trials in phase one, which is on the order of you know, uh, maybe 100, 200 patients, then going to phase two, which is about a thousand patients, 
phase three, which could be a few thousand people, and then the drug is approved. And the one point I would like to bring out here is the y-axis, which is time. So typical drug takes about 10 years to develop. Now that's a long time. And this particularly is going to be relevant because this is one thing that COVID changed. If you look at the COVID vaccine, it was developed in one year. And that kind of speed of drug development, history has never seen. The mRNA vaccine is one of the technologically most advanced vaccine, yet it was developed in one-tenth of the time that a typical drug takes. If you look at the history of vaccination, the previous record of the fastest vaccine was mumps, which was developed in 1967, and that took four years. This is the mumps in the MMR vaccine that, that the kids take, and COVID vaccine just shattered that record and got out there in, in a year. So if, when you think about how has COVID changed our thinking in terms of drug development, time to develop is going to be one thing that it has dramatically impacted. And uh, I think hopefully this will also accelerate the drug development going forward. So time is one issue. Cost is another. A typical drug, and these numbers may be based on the numbers uh, I see in the, uh, in the US, uh, but a typical drug uh, takes about $3 billion. And you know, even modern vaccines are, are taking that. So even though the cost, the time of development has gone down, the cost hasn't. So $3 billion, um, that's a huge number. And you know, I mean, we, we should put that in perspective. Uh, in other fields, what does $3 billion gets you? And one example I would like to uh, bring out is uh, this thing. This is the Mars rovers. Uh, it took off from the planet Earth. And um, you know it, it traveled millions of miles, landed on a different planet, collected samples, collected pictures, and told us about the land that we had only imagined. And this thing cost about $2.5 billion. So it's ironic that it's a, it takes more money to send something within our body to treat a disease than to send something in a far, far away land that we have never seen. And that to me is still a shocking number, right? So why does it take so much money to develop the drug? And uh, the fundamental answer is that uh, we understand the laws of physics far better than we understand the laws of biology. So that's one challenge we're gonna have to figure out. And that's where I think technology can make a huge impact. Uh, you call it uh, mathematical simulations, call it AI, any variety way in which the information comes in, but understanding biology, understanding body is gonna have a huge impact on figuring out how do we, uh, how do we reduce the cost of development? So the, the medical treatment that you may be hearing about, if not already, like gene editing, where you go in and precisely cut the uh, pieces of the DNA, replace the DNA, that's understanding. And those kind of technologies are gonna reduce the cost potentially and also better provide treatment for some of the diseases. Um, this lack of knowledge or lack of understanding of biology, um, the way it reflects in the cost of development is basically summarized in this slide. When a company develops a new drug, it's always a uh, battle between safety and efficacy. So for example, uh, if somebody wants to develop a drug for cancer, a cancer drug, when you deliver in the body, it goes in and kills cancer cells. That's the essence of it. But it is not specific. When it kills cancer cells, it also kills healthy cells. And for each cancer cell, there are thousands and hundred thousands of uh, healthy cells. So how do you build that selectivity into your drug? It's a challenge to build that selectivity. And to find out where that balance is requires a lot of experimentation, a lot of guesswork. And um, 
uh, many times the drugs basically leave a lot of efficacy on the table because it is very difficult to design so much specificity that you can only affect your cancer cells. And because of that, the dosage of the drug is always kind of reduced quite a bit. And because of that, drugs are not as effective as they could be. And then you have to do a lot of experimentation to find out what that dose is, make sure that dose works in animals, in people, and that all that reflects in the high cost and the long, uh, and long time duration of drug development. So people have been in the pursuit of this selectivity because if you can be selective, you can be far more rational in your drug design. You can be far more effective and hopefully you can reduce the cost and time of drug development. And that's what we have seen over the last, I would say 15, 20 years more dramatically. So what kind of drugs are we taking these days? Um, if you go back in time, uh, most drugs were, are, they are small molecules. Uh, if you look at the picture on the left, that's aspirin, acetylsalicylic acid, a small molecule that can be made in huge quantities. Aspirin, annually there are about 100 billion capsules, made, 100 billion pills made, made every day, taken by people worldwide for headache and, uh, and uh, cardiovascular indications. And these drugs are relatively simple to make and give. You just make the chemical drug, you add some uh, inactive ingredients, compress that into a tablet, and you can make billions of these. But small molecules, by definition, are not very selective. So people started going to a larger size. Then came molecules like proteins. The green protein that you see here is insulin. Uh, a molecule that revolutionized the treatment of diabetes was invented almost 100 years ago, but has really made an impact on diabetes in the last 50 years. And insulin is so selective that it only binds to its receptor on the cells and allows it to take glucose and reduce the blood sugar. That's why it works. But the downside is that it has to be injected. You cannot take insulin as a pill. So you gain efficacy, but you are losing the delivery. Then came the antibodies. And you might have heard about this, especially in light of COVID. But before COVID, they were effective in the treatment of cancer uh, and autoimmune diseases like arthritis. But uh, if you imagine, these antibodies selectively bind to their target. So if somebody has uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in their body, antibodies against that, they can bind to it, neutralize it, and reduce the infection. So these have been already in the clinic, and people are taking them. So these are really good, but the challenge now is that these molecules are even larger and they have to be injected intravenously in the blood. So unlike insulin, which patients can take themselves at home, antibodies typically have to be delivered in the blood, which can only be done in the hospital. So right now there is a, is a problem of healthcare management because uh, Giving, up, giving the uh, drug to the patient to, so that they can take at home is a fundamentally different game than having the patient come to the hospital and have, it, have the drug administered in the hospital. Especially these days where people coming to the hospital is, is challenging uh, because of the situation. How can you make drugs even more selective? And that's where the RNA uh, drug came in. Uh, this can be different types of RNAs. Uh, again, RNAs are uh, in the news these days. Uh, before, before COVID, they were used for treating uh, liver diseases, but probably the most uh, famous example of RNA is the mRNA vaccine, uh, which, which is a vaccine out there, uh, one of the vaccines out there. Uh, and RNAs are the molecules when you deliver them into the body, they go into the cell and they make a protein that is encoded by the mRNA. And because each mRNA makes a very specific protein, they make only one kind of protein. So in the case of mRNA vaccine, they make the protein that represents the coating of the virus. The body sees that protein, generates the immune response, the antibodies. So when the real virus comes, the antibodies are already there to fight. But what is the challenge? 
not only um, it's uh, it, it's a challenge to make, but now it has to be stored under very peculiar conditions. Uh, in many cases, it has to be stored at minus 80. So that's a logistical challenge. How do you make sure that the, the drug uh, goes to the patient? Going one step beyond making even more specific drugs, and these are the drugs which are body's own cells. Um, so if you think about building specificity, nothing is as good as body's own cells. The cells are extremely specific in what they do. Your red blood cell, your immune cells. So there are cell therapies. So the drug itself is a cell. And uh, it has already been out there. Uh, you might have heard about this as CAR T therapy. This is the T cell, the immune cell, which is very effective in treating some of the cancers. But now manufacturing this is a challenge because cells you had to grow for individual patient. So essentially for each patient, you had to make their own medicine, the so-called personalized medicine, and the logistics of that is even more challenging, which adds to the cost. So typical cell therapy can cost anywhere between, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars uh, to around half a million dollars, uh, which is quite substantial. So, um, these challenges, you know, when you, when you think about uh, these, uh, uh, these these sort of drugs evolving from simple small molecules to these is complex cells, we also had to think about how we're going to deliver them, uh, and that's where some of our research comes in. Uh, we are a lab uh, that works in the field of what is called drug delivery. So figuring out how do we address some of the challenges that you see at the bottom, how do, we, how do we deliver drugs in a simple way so that it does not require injections? How do we make drugs so that they are stable at room temperature so that you don't require refrigeration? How do we take cells which are more specific and make them even more specific to a certain cell? So that's the field that we work in. So what I'm gonna do next is maybe walk you through some of the uh, highlights of the research that we have done, technologies we have developed, and then we'll end with maybe a summary and then we can uh, spend some time uh, uh, discussing those. So one of the challenges I mentioned is the cost of drug development. And the cost is, is high because experimentation is, is challenging. So typically, uh, when a drug is developed, a lot of experiments are done in mice uh, because mice are relatively inexpensive, but we are not mice. What works in mice does not work in humans necessarily, and that's where a lot of failure has happened. So a question is, can we imagine a microfluidic chip, like semiconductor computer chip, but an actual physical chip where we can grow organs, uh, liver, brain, other organs so we can start screening drugs in those devices and this is called organ on chips that's an emerging field and on the right hand side here at the bottom you see a little brain that we have or uh, a, a brain like device that uh, structure that we have created um, on the chips where the green is a blood vessel and the red is a collection of cells from the brain, and you can use this to screen the drugs, understand what kind of drugs can be delivered, especially when it comes to treating drugs for dementia, for trauma, where drugs have a very difficult time going into the brain, can we start screening drugs so that we can understand better uh, how they go into the brain, and we can reduce the time of experimentation and cost of experimentation. Speaking of delivering into the brain, uh, because it is such a significant challenge, what are the tools that we can develop? And one thing we thought is, you know, maybe instead of trying to uh, rely on synthetic chemistries, can we use body's own cells to go into the brain? While nothing from the drug, from the blood, can normally go into the brain, body's own immune cells can go into the brain whenever they want. Uh, if there is uh, infection in the brain, immune cells infiltrate uh, tremendously into the brain. If there is trauma to the brain, they can go into the brain. So we said, why not hitch a ride on the surface of these immune cells? So we developed a technology. So this purple patch here carries the drug and this uh, huge uh, white gray thing is an immune cell. So we develop, the pa develop these uh, small patches which can attach themselves to the immune cells without bothering them 
and go wherever the immune cell grows, goes. And whenever there is trauma or infection in the brain, these cells go to the brain and they can start treating uh, the local disease. So uh, we call these sort of backpacks. These are little backpacks that the cells carry and they can deliver uh, all kinds of drugs for the treatment of local diseases. Currently, we are using this to treat trauma and cancer. Uh, so these immune cells by themselves are actually quite potent in treating the cancer and these backpacks carry an immunostimulating agent that makes them even stronger to treat uh, the local cancer. Uh, one of the tools that uh, you're going to see a lot in the future is nanomedicine. Uh, these are small nanoparticles, uh, about one one thousandth of the diameter of human cell, and they can carry the drug and deliver it selectively to different parts of the body. And what is interesting about them is that uh, you know if you deliver a small molecule, it goes everywhere. It is not specific. You put that inside the nanoparticle, it becomes very specific. So the whole game is to use these nanoparticles to selectively go to different tissues. How good are they currently? Uh, unfortunately, they are not very effective in terms of targeting. So what this graph shows is that if you look at the selectivity of these nanoparticles to treat cancer, so cancer is where these nanoparticles are very promising. So if you ask yourself of all the nanoparticles that you inject in, in a patient, uh, in an animal, what fraction of that nanoparticle actually reaches the tumor? Turns out that currently that number is less than 1%. So we can't really use nanoparticles if only 1% of them go to the tumor. So there's a large body of research going on in trying to figure out how do we improve the selectivity? How can we get one, two, three, five percent, ten percent of the drug uh, at the tumor site? So one of the approaches that we developed was again to go back to body's own cells and ask them to deliver our nanoparticles selectively to different uh, organs. And here we use red blood cells. So what you're seeing is uh, an actual electronic uh, micrograph of red blood cells. Uh, and on the red blood cells, uh, the red things are these blue nanoparticles, which carry a chemotherapeutic agent. And what, what's uh, something interesting that happens is that if you have free nanoparticles in the blood, your body's immune cells clear them out. But when you put them on the red blood cells, actually they are shielded from the immune cell because the immune system looks at this and it sees the red blood cell, which is very familiar to it, so it does not clear these nanoparticles. They stay in the blood for a long time and they go to the lungs quite effectively. In fact, we can get about 50% of the injected dose in the lungs. It's a dramatic improvement. We're talking about less than 1% to 50% of the drug going into the lungs and we are using this to treat lung cancer. Lung cancer is one of the uh, uh, most lethal cancers uh, uh, these days. You know, lung being a vital organ, when the when the cancer spreads through the lungs, it's uh, uh, the the, uh, the the prognosis is uh, always a challenge. Uh, so we are using this to treat lung cancer, not only the primary cancer in the lung, but also metastasis that happens in the lungs. Um, another challenge I mentioned is uh, blood loss, right? So uh, uh, coming for trauma. And uh, when somebody loses blood, uh, the, the best treatment currently is to inject platelets. Platelets are body's own cells, uh, which cause clotting. Uh, they circulate uh, without doing anything. Whenever there is blood loss, they, they get to the site of the injury and start forming a plug that becomes a clot. Uh, but platelets are very difficult to handle, very difficult to store. So when accident happens, when the ambulance comes, it's very difficult for them to have a supply of platelets with them because they, they need refrigeration and they are very unstable. So we wondered, can we not develop a solid powder that you can keep uh, in the ambulance uh, uh, for a long time? And whenever ambulance gets to the accident site, you add, uh, you, die, you make a solution out of it, inject it into the blood and uh, reduce the blood loss. 
And currently, no such technology exists. There is nothing out there that you can inject in the blood to stop the bleeding. So we developed this polymeric technology, uh, this blue thing here. Uh, it's like a almost like cotton-like uh, uh, material. You can keep it dry and when needed, add water, dilute it, make a solution and inject it. And we showed that it actually can have a dramatic impact on the reduction of blood loss and improve the survival, in this case, the survival of animals. Uh, but the goal is to take this technology from animals into humans uh, through the right uh, development. Uh, maybe one or two last examples. Uh, this is one of our uh, latest uh, uh, approach. And this really speaks to getting the medication to the patients. Uh, as I mentioned, more and more drugs are going from small molecules to proteins. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, about 70% of the drugs, maybe 80% of the drugs were a small molecule that you can take as a pill. But these days, uh, more than half the drugs are getting towards proteins, which had to be injected. Pro injections are difficult, uh, they are painful, and people don't like them. So we wondered, can we not just simply develop a pill that you can take uh, uh, for proteins? It's very challenging because when you, when you take protein orally, when it goes into your stomach, it gets digested. That's the purpose of the stomach, to chew up or to, to destroy any protein that comes in and convert that into its components, which are amino acids, and have those amino acids absorb into blood circulation. And if you swallow insulin, it's gonna have the same fate. It's not gonna be able to make it uh, into your blood circulation. So we developed a technology using uh, what is called ionic liquids, which are liquid salts. And we showed that when you constitute insulin in this liquid salts, you can make that into a pill. And that insulin is now available into the bloodstream. So we showed through a series of experiments the feasibility of this. And currently this technology is under development to eventually go to the humans. And this kind of technology can have a dramatic impact, especially on vaccine delivery. Uh, some of you may remember uh, the campaign. Uh, I remember as, as a, as a uh, kid growing up in India uh, for polio vaccine, which was called Do Bun Zindagike. And uh, the healthcare workers went from door to door and put a couple of drops of the polio vaccine in the kid's mouth and they vaccinated them. And at that time, obviously, I didn't know the significance of that, but that has essentially helped eradicate polio worldwide. Uh, polio vaccine had been around many, many years before that, but it was an injectable vaccine. It required people to come to the clinic to get vaccinated. And many in rural parts of uh, India and worldwide and everywhere, uh, that process is challenging. So what works is when the healthcare worker goes to the door and gives the vaccine. But it's very difficult for somebody to go to the door to start injecting people. It's a very, uh, it requires infrastructure. But if you just have a bottle and just kind of give a couple of drops to the, to the kid, that's easy to do. So converting vaccines from injections to oral pills, that has completely changed the game for polio. But for current all other vaccines, we are still talking about injections. Certainly COVID, but all other important vaccines are given by injections. So converting those injections into uh, the oral uh, dose is, is actually gonna have a, a transformative impact. Um, the, uh, the challenge uh, I think that needs to be addressed is not only in terms of uh, delivery, but also collection, collection of information. Uh, here I'm showing a device uh, that was developed by a company that we started. Uh, it's for collection of blood. Uh, for those of you who have taken uh, have have taken a, a blood sample from you may remember that in the right top corner this is how it is done you go to a phlebotomist you sit in the chair and they put a needle and draw the blood from you it, it's a process that hasn't changed for the last hundred years it's essentially barbaric it's painful nobody really likes it why is it so difficult to get blood so we we uh, work to develop a technology which has a device like this. Uh, it's been approved for use in, in, for some indications. And it's a device that you put on the skin, you push the green button and uh, it uh, collects small amounts of blood 
uh, and the, the blood is stored and that blood can be used for diagnose, diagnosing uh, diseases. The patient doesn't feel any pain, they don't see the needle, so it's a, it's a uh, painless and patient compliant way of collecting blood. And information is going to have a dramatic impact. And this probably all, all of us can relate to. Uh, there are all kinds of sensors that we're already putting on ourselves. Uh, blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen. These are already digitized in a small, um, in a small device that we are walking with. Uh, blood glucose is, made, is getting measured continuously. Uh, there are devices which can measure uh, cortisol level, which are indicative of stress. So you can imagine you can constantly monitoring somebody's stress. And when you have all this information, the question is, what are we going to do with this information? And that's where technologies like AI come in. If you imagine collecting this data on a continuous basis uh, from hundreds of millions of patients, what kind of new knowledge can we develop? And how can that knowledge allow us to develop new therapies and new treatments? I think that's going to be a challenge that is really going to come uh, in, 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 uh, in the direction of the technologies. So let me um, sort of uh, pause here with maybe a couple of concluding thoughts just to kind of give you uh, some uh, my uh, you know views as to what technologies are going to be emerging and going to have an impact on uh, on the future of uh, uh, health and what impact will they, will it have on on people? Um, I think the drug the the time for drug development uh, it it should and it likely will go down. Uh, as I mentioned, ten years has been the norm, and you know. Up until last year, whenever I asked a question to somebody, why does it take 10 years to develop a drug? The answer has been, because it does. That's how it is. And one thing that COVID has done, it has made us question things. Uh, the way we work has changed. The way we communicate in COVID has changed. The way we interact as a society because of COVID has changed. And the way we develop the drug will also change. That's one beneficial thing I think has come out of COVID. And the technology that support it are like organ on chips, AI, which is generating a lot of understanding from the data. Personalized medicine is gonna be uh, the, the thing of the future. Historically, when you think about drug development, it was all about making a large quantity of drug. Can you make tons of aspirin? Can you make uh, tons of insulin? Making drug for everything that works on everyone. And that paradigm is going to individual treatments because we are not equal. Again, COVID has taught us that. Same infection. Some people just walk away like nothing has happened, no symptoms of any kind. And some patients are dying within hours, 24 hours, 48 hours because of the uh, cardiopulmonary complications. What is triggering this tremendously different response? That is the essence of personalization. And cell therapies is one example because we're talking about making medicine for one patient that is specific to that patient. Targeted therapies. Targeting medication is the, is the solution to decouple efficacy and safety. And that's putting currently a lot of constraint on the drug development. Uh, if you can specifically target a certain cell, a certain organ, the space of drug development is going to dramatically expand. And that's where technology is going to have a huge impact. Nanomedicine is one example. Precision therapies, uh, where you go in and make very precise changes in, in, in something in the body. Gene editing is one example, where uh, you are essentially cutting a piece of DNA and replacing with a new piece of DNA. So you're not changing anything else in the body, but just going with a surgical precision at the cellular level. And that has, again, the potential to decouple efficacy from safety. And that's going to build, a, uh, uh, I think the, that's going to be enabling us to do a lot of, uh, develop a lot of interesting drugs. Uh, CRISPR uh, is one example. Uh, digital health, uh, this is probably one area where COVID has uh, dramatically impacted. And this means digital health comes in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, one way is collecting information and making use of it. Variables, people are walking with all kinds of sensors. Can you monitor patients remotely? 
can you can you follow up uh, on their uh, uh, wellness remotely? It's already happening. Uh, there is also a wave coming where uh, uh, digital solutions are therapies, right? So uh, there are products under development where the treatment is a video game. And that's something we would not have envisioned 15 years ago. Uh, how do you take those kind of treatments through the approval process? I think it's going to be a tremendously exciting opportunity uh, for future, especially people working at the interface of uh, computer science, AI, medicine, uh, for them to develop these new technologies that can support it. Uh, patient compliance, uh, making medicine is not good enough. You have to make patients take it and patients won't take it if it is very difficult for them to do it. And that may mean having to take it by injections uh, or having to take multiple injections, even multiple pills. If there is a drug that requires taking five times a day, people are gonna miss it. So how do you develop technologies which make it easy for the patient to take the drug is gonna be very important moving forward. And finally, health equity. Uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis uh, on developing drugs in high income countries or for high income population. And typically all many drugs have started that way, but they cannot end that way. Uh, if, can, if we only are treating certain part of the society, it's not sustainable. As I mentioned, a typical gene therapy currently costs half a million dollars. A typical antibody therapy for uh, arthritis cause, costs about you know, $15,000, $20,000. That's not affordable for a vast majority of the population of the globe. So we had to reduce uh, the cost and make deployable technologies. And that's where technology can really help uh, in, in sort of addressing the problems of the future. So let me stop here. Um, sort of, you know, one, one note I want to leave you with is, you know, uh, this science and technology, I, I think, will make a huge impact on health. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is how the face of uh, science looks like. Uh, you know, science is not done in, in one particular place by one particular type of people. Uh, this is my research group. Um, you know, these are graduate students and postdocs uh, who are working, uh, you know, pretty hard on these, these uh, interesting and, and important problems. And uh, they are the ones uh, who are driving the future. Students in the audience, you are the ones driving the future. So uh, I hope you know uh, you take on this challenge. Uh, it's a challenge of technology, society, uh, economics. Uh, because if you solve only one part of the game, it's not going to be enough. If we just develop medicines, but they're expensive, it's not going to help. If we uh, uh, you know, if we develop the drug, but if they're not sustainable for the industry to make it, if the finances of that don't work out, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. So the interface of these disciplines is going to drive the future and uh, uh, you are the one doing it. So all the best and I'm really looking forward to uh, what comes in the future. So let me stop here and if there is time, I'll be happy to answer any questions or uh, start the discussion. Thank you, sir. This was indeed a fascinating look into the challenges and the up and coming technologies and innovations that would sooner or later revolutionize, revolutionize the field of healthcare. So before we proceed with the question and answer session, we'd like to introduce Sri Sami Somaya, sir, Vice uh, Chancellor of Somaya Vidya Vihar University, Chairman of KJ Somaya Trust, KJ Somaya Medical Trust, KJ Somaya Institute of Applied Agriculture Research and the Girivanwasi Pragati Mandi. Under his guidance, the Somaya Trust manages over 30 different educational institutions of learning extending from elementary to PhD in diverse areas such as medicine, engineering, the arts and sciences, religion, vocational studies, education, languages, etc. He has done his Bachelor of Science chemical engineering, master of chemical engineering and MBA from Cornell University and master of public administration from Harvard University. As visitor instructor, as visiting instructor in the school of chemical engineering at Cornell University, he combines his love for education and chemistry. I invite Sri Sami Somaya sir to please deliver the concluding remarks. Welcome sir. Um, that was an incredible talk um, 
that's my namesake, Dr. Samir. Thank you so much for uh, that incredible um, uh, talk, spelling out what you see as the future and the challenges for healthcare. I uh, compliment the organizers for putting together this conference today. I think as you mentioned, the last year has been an incredibly challenging environment for us in the field of um, life, I would say. Uh, why just healthcare? Uh, from seeing COVID in the newspaper, uh, what was supposed to be in Wuhan, later seeing how it was in Spain or in Italy, and then see how it reached the US and wondering whether we would be immune to it uh, here in India because magically that's what some people would say. Realizing that uh, this is a area of public health and uh, we are all affected by good public health, bad public health or good medical care. Um, we got a, I will say a living experience online. So, I say online, online means on the go when Dr. Varsha and her team um, and we decided to try and prepare ourselves to be ready for the COVID uh, pandemic should it come to the Indian shores using all techniques, crowdfunding to raise resources, um, you know, to build ventilator capacity from five to 34 critical care beds to 74 and more than, you know, to be treated 4,000 people for COVID in the tertiary environment. Are dealing with situations like government policy, uh, how they sought to make beds available for the larger public dealing with issues of equity and access that uh, Dr. Samir mentioned about. Uh, how do you deal with the logistics? Uh, how do you deal with the human resources? How do you deal with people um, when it comes to the nursing, the medical care, the ward boys, or even the person in the cafeteria who seeks to deliver food to what he considers is a risky patient to deliver food to? Um, it's been a remarkable uh, challenge. And I think that, and of course, financially for us uh, hospitals, it's also been an incredible challenge how to keep the, the ship afloat. Um, I think these are case studies also that need to be captured um, in the form of case studies or courses so that uh, future generations understand what such unusual events um, can um, or should provoke or should not provoke, uh, whether it is simple tools such as masking or whether it is how drugs are developed um, and how also um, it affects personal lives. Um, you know, in my own case, we had a bereavement caused by COVID just about 10 days ago. So, you know, it is, uh, it is very challenging um, to see it numbers numerically and also to see it individually and the effect that this um, has. Um, separately speaking, uh, I spent some time in the Cambridge ecosystem when I did my master's in public administration in 2005. Um, four and five, I was there for a year and I spent time also at, um, at the media lab at MIT when I took a lot of courses there. Um, and, and I saw that absolutely fabulous environment of discovery, learning uh, that happened in that world. And I'm sure you are an MIT chemical engineer. So Bob Langer is probably somebody you know, I visited his lab. Um, it was interesting and I always used to wonder uh, why we in India uh, couldn't have education uh, ecosystems uh, that actually created such a wide ecosystem of uh, discovery, research, and just pure excitement rather than transmission of certain textbooks written many years ago. Why couldn't we simply guide students to discover uh, the future and the world in the manner uh, what uh, Dr. Samir just mentioned? And so that is the aim and uh, soon, and, and of course, uh, as I teach, continue to teach at Cornell in their master's in chemical engineering program, of course, as a visiting faculty, I see how uh, top universities continue to uh, enable faculty and students to go forward. So I think the aim of our university, and we are just one year old as a university, we may be much older as an education institution, is to put that 
together and create that ecosystem. While I was at uh, MIT, Harvard, I met a friend from the uh, Weinberg lab, uh, which is, of course, you probably know, a big cancer lab who's now at MD Anderson. And we started doing interesting work in drug discovery here in India. And there also the thought with me and my friend, Dr. Mani, was why can't India create real new drug discovery? So again, in our institution, we've also created a program in life sciences. And as we continue to become a university, we would dream to create an entire ecosystem which goes from looking at, you know, all the men, you know, we don't have the resources that you have. And, but, you know, I think at the journey, begins with, uh, you know, with us, you know, at least you have to take the first steps towards there. So, you know, taking the, and taking the entire gamut of what we've said, we've talked about a, a pandemic, we've talked about learning as it influences us statistically or individually. But I think we can never forget that these are uh, real people and uh, real issues of uh, health. Um, we, uh, you know, ultimately health um, can be addressed by individual decisions and the learning and discoveries we make uh, as a community, which can be inspired in educational institutions and carried out in healthcare as delivery mechanisms. I think we have to remember discovery and ultimately delivery and policy of public health so that it goes forward. Um, I, I really think that this was a very inspiring address that you gave, uh, Doctor, and um, I thank everyone for attending this and uh, you know, I would be delighted to have any of your uh, participation going forward as we try to build this dream institution here in India. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Samirji. <laughs> now I request our keynote address POC, Mahima Kandelwal, to please take over for the question answer session with Dr. Samir Mitra Gudvi, sir. Good evening, sir. So the first question is from our director, ma'am, itself. She intends to ask, are there any parallel studies being carried out on longevity as well? And she has stated a fact that Japanese are supposed to have the highest longevity. Absolutely. A um, lot of work going on. Uh, a lot of it is still focused on getting a better understanding as to exactly what happens in the body when the cells age. Uh, and using that knowledge to uh, develop new therapies. So when it comes to longevity, there are two angles to which, uh, from which people are addressing this challenge. One is coming from the lifestyle management, you know, uh, eating, uh, work-life balance, et cetera. And a lot of that is happening more at a societal level, uh, maybe taking examples from uh, cultural experiences. And, uh, you know, I think the one that you mentioned about uh, learning uh, from what is happening in Japan is probably somewhat in that category. But from the biotechnology point of view, uh, there are therapeutics uh, that people are looking to develop, uh, which can improve longevity. Uh, I would say this is still early research, uh, but given that the, given the discoveries people are making in terms of genetic medicine, uh, you know, I remain very optimistic that there, there would be uh, new therapies moving forward which can address this. Uh, but until then, I think uh, lifestyle-based approaches are the current strategies uh, to address the longevity question. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, another question, as organ on a chip is an emerging technology, the overall cost of it would increase then how is it possible that the new drugs can be made cost-effective when introduced in the market? The organ on chip actually is very inexpensive because it's really a piece of plastic in which you can grow cells. Cells are very cheap, plastic is very cheap, it's, the fabrication is very cheap, and you can make a lot of them. You can, you can do really thousands of them in parallel. Uh, when it comes to experimentation on live subjects, uh, mice are relatively inexpensive, but when it goes from mice to larger animals, that's where the largest expense comes in. So uh, the cost of goods uh, for the experimentation is extremely low. They are emerging, um, so it is. it will still take some time for them to get to a point where they can become uh, essentially the primary source of information. But when that happens, when that knowledge gets developed, they will be dramatically cheaper than the alternative. Thank you, sir. 
another question, a pretty long one. Sir, how soon might we be able to ingest generic medicines through patches? How is ingestion better than taking medicines orally or through injections? Is this method medicine or disease specific or can it be done for all sorts of ailments? Also, is there any ongoing research in this field in the area of mental health illness? Ah. Um, I think oral medicines or patches are inherently better than injections because they are painless, they're easy to take, and um, you can have it self-administered. So just imagine, you know, if we had a vaccine pill, uh, it could be mailed to the patient so that patient can take it at home. Uh, one of the challenges for vaccines is the administration. The vaccine is there, but it's difficult to actually give it to people. Um, so a patch you can put on the skin or a pill you can take uh, would be a lot easier if you can ship it to, to people. Uh, whether it can be used for uh, genetic medicine, uh, I think that's the thing of the future. Uh, genetic medicine themselves are relatively new. So as they mature, uh, their delivery by other technologies will also mature. Uh, but if you look at some of the other uh, therapeutics, uh, they are going to be the first ones to, like pep peptides and protein drugs, they're going to be the first ones to be delivered by oral pills and patches and genetic medicines will follow. Uh, mental health um, is always a huge uh, part of the overall health question. Uh, and again, COVID has probably brought this to uh, the forefront. As people's lifestyle get disrupted, uh, from you know, working in the office to working from home. Uh, in many cases, people have lost jobs. Uh, the, the social infrastructure around them has dramatically changed and all that has and uh, you know, potentially will lead to a more uh, uh, mental illnesses. And uh, uh, there are therapies uh, that people are developing uh, and have developed, uh, but I think my, in my opinion, I think there is even a stronger need to develop additional therapies. So uh, hopefully we'll see more in the future. So that means we'll see more research in the near future about the same. I think so. Right, sir. sir, do you think there is increased risk of more pandemics in near future? Because the lifestyle of people, the way people are living right now has changed drastically because of the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> So the, the uh, threat of the pandemic has always been there. If you look at historically what has happened, every now and then things have hit the society, right? going back to the 18th century and 19th century. So we just had to be prepared. And uh, you know, I think uh, in this case, probably nobody thought that a pandem pandemic would hit at this day and age, but it did. Um, so nobody can predict the future. And I think trying to predict the actual risk of pandemic is not going to help anybody. But what will help is be prepared. Prepared in terms of following the right hygiene, preparing in terms of getting the vaccines ready, uh, and preparing in terms of having the infrastructure ready. So when it hits, we are prepared and we can tackle it in a very effective manner. Thank you, sir. So the last question, it's a request actually from Dr. Vaseem Gori. He asks you to elaborate on the role of remote patient monitoring and digital health in managing chronic medical conditions like type 2 diabetes, hypertension, heart diseases, etc. So that's going to be the future, I think. Um, it was already going in that direction, uh, but the uh, pandemic will even accelerate in that direction. So what does it take to really monitor patients remotely? One is you need a good line of communication between the patient and the physician. And two, you need information, uh, information about the physiology. Uh, some of the things like you know, blood pressure, uh, pulse, temperature, uh, there are already sensors which can collect the information very easily. So the patients can wear them and you can actually have that transmitted to the doctor continuously. Some of the more challenging ones like uh, blood sugar and other health metric, they are maturing. So as those technologies become more commonplace, uh, digital health becomes uh, more and more common. Uh, 
it's very country specific uh, in some countries i mean especially i think in india it's still relatively easy to actually see a doctor you can actually show up in doctor's office and see uh, the doctor in the us it's a big process you have to make an appointment uh, you know well in advance and and be there so in places where in person appointments are very difficult uh, i think you know uh, re- remote monitoring and and remote uh, Uh, counseling makes a lot of sense and uh, that will happen just a matter of time thank you so much sir i hope all the queries of everybody has been addressed and we're looking forward for the further session thank you sir. thank you so much for your questions thank you so much sir i now request dr prema basargekar ma'am program coordinator of mba healthcare management to deliver a vote of thanks for the keynote address Thank you Dr. Ranjita. Am I audible now? Yes ma'am you are. Okay. So respected dignitaries and participants this is indeed my pleasure to thank you all. Erstwhile PGDM healthcare now which is called as MBA healthcare management is actually a new program which was set up in 2018. in earlier two years we had a round table conferences where we invited industry experts and which we received a very good response this year with the encouragement of our uh, board of studies and our director dr monika khanna we launched a very very ambitious plan to have a first international healthcare conference and our board of studies member not only help us in encouraging us but they also get us uh, internationally acclaimed healthcare experts as a panel members uh dr samir uh, mitra uh, sorry uh, mr samir mitra gotri put full trust in us to develop this course by using all the resources of the campus and encourage us to experiment a lot and we are very very thankful for the same we could not have got a better eminent keynote addresser as compared to dr samir mitra gotri to truly launch us on a international level Dr Samir we are truly thankful to you from the bottom of our heart to give us this kind of to accept our humble request and to give us the opportunity to interact with you and we really look forward to have you on our campus thank you very much and i look forward to the, the uh, next session of the panel discussion over to you anuja and shreyas thank you prema uh, thank, you. thank you so much ma'am Now we begin with the next part of our event the panel discussion on the topic global initiatives in healthcare to improve well-being we're proud to have amongst us illustrious personalities from the healthcare sector and would like to take this opportunity to introduce our eminent panelists first we have dr alex lewis sir dr lewis has extensive experience in healthcare provision and management in the uk and in multiple jurisdictions including europe the middle east and australia He has operated at senior levels within the public and private sector including at executive director level at healthcare providers national clinical lead at the regulator and in medical director role at a large consultancy with multinational presence he is a clinician in active practice and has a special interest in technology as applied to healthcare and improvement in healthcare systems and services it's an honor to have you amidst us sir Next we have Dr Rakesh Gupta sir he is the president of the Rajasthan Cancer Foundation in Jaipur and the honorary consultant for tobacco cessation SDMH Jaipur a WHO director general award recipient in 2013 for his work in tobacco control as an individual in the southeast asia region he has represented india as a member of asia pacific regional network of quit line since 2012 In the last 15 years he has singularly implemented public health models on smoke free cities tobacco free workplaces systems approach in tobacco cessation and quit line through state medical helplines all for the very first time in india we're very elated to have you here with us today so we also have with us mr omar bhat sir He's an independent healthcare consultant and co-founder at Vida Healthcare Solutions and innovation account lead at Imperial College Health Partners. After over a decade of working for the industry supplying healthcare, he made the move to provider 
where he has worked on behalf of a number of institutes helping shape innovation strategy. He has developed and manages an ecosystem to nurture and accelerate life sciences related innovation to commercialization, ensuring it is aligned with market preferences for rapid spread and adoption with impact. He's currently involved in multiple early, mid and late stage ventures and mentors several life science innovators globally. It's a pr privilege to be able to host you, sir. We also have with us Dr. Raju Manohar Jotkar, sir. He's the senior consultant at Raj Mata Jijau Nutrition Mission, funded by UNICEF. He has worked for 37 years in the public health department of the government of Maharashtra, starting from MOPHC to joint director NHM, of which four years on deputation with University of Toronto as research scientist. He is an MD in preventive and social medicine with distinction and is a first rank holder and a gold medicine from Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He has 21 papers to his credit, published in international and national journals. We're glad to have you amidst us, sir. Next, we have Mr. Hassan Chaudhry, sir. Hassan, sir, is a director at Vita Healthcare and also promotes the UK digital health and care sector abroad at Healthcare UK, a joint initiative of the Department of Health and Social Care. NHS England and the Department for International Trade with a global role advising commercial teams in over 100 UK embassies. His background is in frontline social work, NHS informatics, con commissioning and public health. He later co-founded an award-winning agency focusing on real-world evidence and health analytics which was acquired in 2019. He holds an honorary research post at Imperial College London for his work in data science and is a mentor for the NHS Innovation Accelerator. The Financial Times named him in the top 100 most influential BAME leaders in UK tech in 2019. It is an honor to have you with us, sir. Next, we have Dr. Mangesh Pednikar, sir. He is the director of Healy Sikh Sarya Institute for Public Health, Navi Mumbai. He is also a visiting scientist at the Department of Society, Human Development and Health, Harvard School of Public Health, USA. He is the principal investigator at on NIH-funded RO1 grant title Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Tobacco Use and Tobacco Control Policy in India, in collaboration with the University of Michigan. Dr. Petnikar has over 22 years of extensive experience in national and international collaborative research management and implementation developing collaborative research products, projects, and building relationships with collaborators. He has primarily worked in the area of tobacco control research and NCD control research. His major inter research interests are tobacco, nutrition, and NCD epidemiology. It is a pleasure indeed to have you on the panel, sir. Next, we have Mr. Anil Patil, sir. Anil sir has 25 years of experience in the international development sector as a development practitioner grant maker and trustee. He is now founder and executive director of Carols Worldwide, which works across India, Nepal and Bangladesh to bring about systemic change for family carers and highlights the issues facing unpaid family carers in low and middle income countries, a group largely unrecognized and unsupported. The innovative nature of Anil Sir's work and its huge potential for social impact has resulted in him being awarded an International Ashoka Fellow in 2015, making more Health Fellow in 2016 and Cordis Fellowship in 2017. He has guided allocations of over 25 million pounds in grants for charitable purposes. So far, Carers Worldwide has transformed the lives of more than 73,000 carers and their family members. It is our privilege to host you, sir. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Pramod Prabhakaran, sir esteemed moderator for our panel discussion. Pramod sir has over 20 years of experience in clinical, educational and leadership roles in the UK. He is a faculty and board member for healthcare management at Somaya Institute of Management India. He maintains active clinical practice as a consultant in the UK NHS, has an active role in supporting digital innovation and heads international partnerships at Imperial College Health Partners. He co-founded Kit for Carers, a non-profit organization to support the care community with programs supporting employment and PPE in the UK and India. 
He lectures on health innovation at Imperial College Business School and Frankfurt Business School. We are glad we got this opportunity to host you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It's a real privilege to be here. And um, if I may repeat some of the comments from earlier about Dr. Samir Mitragotri's talk about the future of healthcare and about health equity. And what we hope to do today is to try and expand that discussion to include the wider health and care community so we can focus on globally what are we doing in terms of health innovation and health inequality. Um, one other point that um, I think it's worth repeating again is, you know, we are here in the management school, although the students are dialing in from all different parts of India, and the last year has been very different, you know, for all of us. But the future of healthcare is certainly linked to technological innovation, but it's also, but it's also very much determined by you as a, as a cohort. Hello? So, so you are the future of healthcare, and our job as a panel today is to engage, interact with you, share our expertise, um, and I have the job of having um, an illustrious panel to, to, to probe and challenge so that as a student community, you are enthused to, do, to discover and do research and, and be the future of healthcare uh, as, as we determined. Our panel briefly has people from a very diverse background, but all panel members have global international sort of work and research experience. And I can see our panel members on screen now, but they all bring a passion to improve health outcomes for the population. And when we talk about health outcomes for the population, unfortunately, what doctors and nurses and the hospitals do accounts for very little directly. It accounts for probably less than 15%. So the 85% of the health of the population is determined by other indicators, the wider determinants of health, as we call it. And those include the socioeconomic indicators, lifestyle, and we have some eminent panel members here who worked very much on lifestyle and nutrition, and I will, I will ask them to elaborate on their experience. Um, we, will, we will look at you know, behavioral factors, you know, education and other things. Very importantly, when we, when we have gone through the last year, we've been able to shine a light on, on what has been a relatively marginalized unrecognized part of our health and care system. And there is no healthcare without care. And we are very fortunate to have Anil Patil from Carers Worldwide, who, who has experience across a number of countries um, and is able to bridge the understanding and share the sort of strategic insights on, on, on what direction that should take. Um, I, will, I will start off with some questions and we'll try and keep it as informal and interactive and and we'll take questions from the audience, particularly the students as we go along. Um, uh, yes, sir, few... adding to, uh, so sorry, sir, just wanted to add one point sure. there. Uh, to the audience, you can send in your questions to the POC of uh, the panel discussion, who's uh, Dr. Diksha Kuntal. She'll be forwarding your questions to Pramod, sir. And from there, he will be taking your questions. So just as a, as, a, as a prelude to our discussion and what's been happening with, with COVID, yesterday in the UK, we had the highest death toll. So 2021 has started off with a surge in cases, as you're all probably aware. So we are not out of this yet. Vaccination and other you know, therapeutics are, are improving our, uh, our, our chance of mitigating some of the consequences of COVID but we are still in the midst of a raging pandemic. But the pandemic has had an unequal impact. It has affected the frail, the elderly, the mentally unwell, the disabled, the poorer parts of our community far more. And if, if anything, it has amplified the health inequalities 
So going back to Dr. Samir's point, if we need to tackle health, if we need to have health equity, we must innovate. We must innovate so that we improve population-based health. We must address prevention, lifestyle factors, and mental health issues. And we should value and systematically include the care community in all aspects of our healthcare. So, so some of the themes we'll touch upon is what is health and well-being? You know, what are the global narratives? What's happening globally? What have we learned from COVID? And, and where is the future of healthcare leading? And we are fortunate to have among our panel um, members who are very much um, you know, embedded into the health innovation ecosystem. So we'll expand on some of the discussions on digital and AI and, and medtech broadly. Um, we, will, we will also touch upon the role of information and data in terms of getting insights. And we, have, we are very fortunate to have Helis um, Institute, Dr. Pednecker supporting this. And, and we, would, we would want to enthuse the students to take up research projects, utilize the data and work on that. So we'll hear more on that. So I might start off in, in no particular order, but I'll start off with a question to, to, to Alex perhaps. Alex, you, you, you've advised um, various you know, governments and health systems on, um, on, 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 on population health and, and mental health, and more recently done extensive work on well-being. Could you share some insights? You know, are there differences? Are we all trying to achieve the same thing? What, what, are, what are your insights, experiences, Alex? Thank you very much, Marga. And, and, and first to say thank you again for the invitation. It's my honor to be able to attend the, the panel um, today. Um, and one thing which has been overwhelming for me uh, has struck that it doesn't matter whatever jurisdiction that anyone works in, what I've worked in, um, and people from very different backgrounds, uh, different societies, there is one common language um, that's used, and that's about um, healthcare, about well-being. And in particular, two things I would say comes out of that is the importance, no matter where we are, is outcomes for people. I nearly said patients, but we're talking much wider than that, about outcomes for people, and also striving um, for excellence. And in my experience, it doesn't matter where, where we are um, in the world, that is the common language. And that's the thing that we need to strive towards. Otherwise, we risk inequalities. Uh, we, we risk failing to achieve the best we can for our people. Thank you, Alex. And uh, again, we, we can be informal and interactive and we can jump in as needed. So please unmute yourself, all of you on the panel and feel free. I'll, 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 you know, we, we look at it from a global perspective and, and Hassan, you work with a number of embassies day in and day out. And, and, and you know, what, what are your sort of insights on, on where the future is and where things are? Thank you so much. And by the way, an absolute honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, I think there's been a trend over the years for health systems to be reactive. They wait for people to get sick. Then they come into a big hospital facility with lots of beds. They treat them in the most expensive way that they can. They send them home and then they cross their fingers and they hope and they pray that nothing happens to them and they don't come back. So that's, that's been the trend for many years. And what COVID has exposed is that there are a number of issues with that approach you've got to be able to deal with patients in a way that means that they can look after themselves. So you are talking to citizens and people, not people who've, who've got a condition and they become patients. You've got to deal with them early on. That's the prevention point that Alex just made. And it's a good point. But also we can't keep having people come into expensive facilities. The number of people that we have, the capacity that we have to treat people across the world is not enough. And let me make a bold statement. We're probably 15 to 20 million carers short, healthcare professionals short worldwide to deal with the people with the growing burden of care. Therefore, unless we reduce that burden of care and also support those who deliver care, we won't have a system left. And so more advanced systems 
have actually just come to that conclusion and have started to empower citizens, reduce the number of beds, work more on prevention and digital. And I think other systems around the world have seen COVID have forced them that direction. And that's where I see the trend. And, and what's been the experience in, in India, in Mumbai, you know, uh, Dr. Mangesh? I might, I might just yeah. use first names here, so we'll keep it informed. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, that yeah. will be even okay. better. So, yeah. so okay. Dr. Pramal, uh, thank you very much for Pramod. like Pramod. linking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Pramod, uh, for Pramod. linking the Samir's presentation to now the panel discussion. And I must say that ki Dr. Samir has set a platform for the discussion. And I'm, I'm like trying to little bit elaborate on that point in the context of India and in the context of the participant of this conference, which is mostly our future health professionals or health researchers. So as you have seen the dynamic and you as rightly said that curative versus preventive, the curative part forms maybe around 15 to 20 percent. But there is a still a huge 80 to 85 percent, which is basically more focused on prevention and has a larger impact, not only at within India, but at a global prospect too. Just to give an example, if you recall the slide of cause of death worldwide data from Dr. Sami's presentation, and there you might have seen that non-communicable disease were at the top five, whereas the communicable disease were at the bottom. But if you look at that data in the context of developing countries or even in the context of India, it will be like more or less communicable disease, which is more as a traditional problem, which is continuing, which we are not able to solve as on today. But at the same time, because of the lifestyle change and the global kind of uh, transition, the non-communicable disease problem is also becoming a huge problem. So India basically is in a unique position where we have a double burden. We have a communicable disease problem. We have a non-communicable disease problem and drug and treatment it's very very essential but at the same time it is still very far from the general population in terms of the affordability and the limited health infrastructure available in countries like india when i say limited i'm talking about outside cities like the situation in mumbai or major cities in india that it may be slightly different but when you go at least 10 kilometer away from these major cities you will see the situation is totally different there is a like lot of problems are available so in that case, just to elaborate on specific points, like Dr. Uh, Samir has mentioned about major causes like diabetes, cancer, and hypertension. So if you look at, there is a lot of treatments available for cancer. There are a lot of treatment available for diabetes. There is a treatment available for hypertension. But we as a public health, uh, like a researcher or like public health personnel, we also have to focus the pre-diabetes, pre-hypertension, and pre-cancer. When I say this pre, because we have to work very hard not to get healthy people get into this disease form. Just to give an example that tobacco is one of the best example. Like for example, when you talk about cancer, smoking is associated with lung cancer is single most preventable cause of death, uh, like worldwide. And when you talk about India, oral cancer is basically related with the smokeless forms of tobacco. Similarly, when you talk about diabetes, you may, might have seen that key lifestyle factor, then again, diet. These are the factors which are basically uh, uh, like can be a made intervention and hypertension again, pre-hypertension versus hypertension. So there is a significant population available in this pre-hypertension, pre-diabetes and pre-cancer or any pre-disease. So that is where we have to focus and we have to come up with some kind of innovative ways and their technology also plays a very, very important role how it will play a very important role because you may develop an evidence-based intervention to control NCD, but it required to be scaled up or massed to a country level or even at the Southeast Asia level or at the developing country level. So that is where technology will play a very, very important. And COVID has basically, I must say that provided us a platform. I must say, because so far we were not like uh, exploring all these, like having conferences, national conferences, international conferences, so far it was only in person. But now this sure. is again, there are so many conferences has taken place in the global platform through uh, like online Zoom and other things.
so that will provide an open and a platform for this and that is the point i'm saying and all healthcare researcher there is a plenty of opportunity available in various sectors where i have mentioned not only on the drug and uh, curative but there is a lot of opportunities are available from the preventive point of as well over to you pramod thank you thank you i i might ask dr uh, rakesh uh, rakesh if i if i may address you by your first please, name please. Um, you, your background was very interesting in our discussion, from a surgical oncologist to uh, leading the tobacco and smoking cessation programs. Can you give some insights from your journey, and where do you see the role of lifestyle and behaviors in terms of preventive healthcare, which is which is what you your role is on a daily basis? Thank you, Pramod. And uh, the transition happened primarily with the logic. Uh, and uh, with due considerations that if I operate uh, another 20 years as a surgical oncologist, maybe I'll be treating another 10,000 patients. But if I work through the public health, maybe I'll affect millions. And uh, that has been my focus uh, of transition. It was uh, not an easy one, but a considered one. So it was something which could engage me 24 by 7. Also, I consider one of the things which happened in life is to change the modality of working from creating an awareness in the community to be an implementer. And that happened through my training with American Cancer Society as to how should I work to be effective. And that helped me to create the India's first smoke-free city. Also, the tobacco-free workplace as a model for the United Nations for through the Commonwealth Secretariat for one of the 16 good case studies for non-communicable disease control. Then I worked with the uh, quit lines uh, in India. So that has given me the sense of how we can have a high community reach for the people who cannot visit the hospital seven and can also develop simultaneously a good uh, model for the research as, as well because of the collection of the data and the follow-ups that it provides. Also with working through the systems approach in tobacco treatment in the hospitals as to how we can use that facility and all the facilities in healthcare for screening, treating and following up with the tobacco dependence treatment. And that I think is a very, very important aspect which is very easily adoptable without much of infrastructural or otherwise other costs and people can be benefited hugely in preventing the lifestyle illnesses. Uh, one of the aspects, of course, because it's tobacco, but yes, similar attempts can be made for uh, controlling the obesity, for enhancing physical activity. So I consider uh, eventually as a practitioner for health that hospitals actually are giving us right now a good opportunity if we can have uh, the health management and the consultants come together to be focused in uh, helping people uh, with the improvement in the lifestyles instead of working in a focused way as we work in a tertiary care center for treating illnesses, which is rather dismal, I would say. I'm not very negative about it, but the advancements that I have seen in last 30 years in uh, malignancy in oncology I consider we have not really made a huge, huge progress as we would see except for very few cancers and that also in the clinical setting. If we see overall, when we see for reducing the incidence and prevalence or the mortality of the cancer, uh, we have really not made a huge progress. So that has been uh, my life journey in a brief manner. But feel free to ask me more questions on this. Very impressive. And again, you know, uh, members of the panel, you can ask each other questions also. Let's keep it flowing. Um, may I just jump from um, um, that topic around lifestyle to nutrition? And I know that Dr. Raju um, has done a lot of work around nutrition. I just wanted to explore your experiences and what insights you can share on tackling that as a, as a key indicator of improving health outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Pramod. I mean, uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, I'm a public health physician. I'm a MD in community medicine. Uh, see, the nutrition is a determinant for so many diseases. The communicable disease, as Dr. Mangesh has already pointed out, 
non-communicable diseases as well as the non-communicable diseases. Now, I am referring to the fifth round of NF, which is just uh, declared a week back, which is showing that <laughs> India is facing triple burden of, uh, I mean, uh, malnutrition. Say it's a, uh, I mean, uh, undernutrition, overnutrition, as well as anemia, all are increasing. And I mean, there are the programs uh, which are to combat the nutritional uh, uh, elements have, uh, I mean, uh, benefits to all three specters, but unfortunately, uh, it is not making a dent. Well, the uh, survey was carried out during June to the round was carried out in June 2019 to December 2019. So it was precisely before the COVID. COVID has disrupted the, I mean, economy, disrupted the livelihood, the supply chain management of the, uh, I mean, logistics, and also the health and nutrition services has gone to uh, backseat. Having said that, it might have worsen the scenario with respect to nutrition. So nutrition per se has implications to both communicable and non-communicable diseases. And also a link that in COVID, uh, clinically we have seen those with obesity, those having hypertension and diabetes mellitus, uh, have a serious uh, course of uh, COVID, having more complications and more hospital stay and needing more care. It's not only after becoming a negative with RT-PCR, after that also, a consequences of post-COVID consequences of COVID have also been alarming. And uh, with respect to, I mean, uh, uh, vascular diseases, even mental stress, uh, but there is one take home message there, uh, you know, uh, we could see that, I mean, the new normal set by the COVID uh, scenario, uh, uh, I mean, social distancing and hand washing, hand hygiene, ha could reduce the FICO oral root of diseases in Mumbai city by 72%. The hepatitis incidence has come down. You know, the behavioral changes over a period of time we were trying, but the scare of COVID has made people aware and that could give up spill or benefit in form of waterborne diseases. So, you know, uh, we have to look from the perspective, as you said, the context rightly, it's not from the purity and hospital side, uh, I mean, uh, institutional care, but also, uh, I mean, the determinants of the healthcare and then the home-based care also. These are the elements, uh, the gamut of which is a very wide one. And we have to acclimatize it to the uh, I mean, uh, COVID scenario, which has given us a, I mean, a challenge. It is challenging us, and uh, we have to turn this crisis, COVID crisis, into opportunity as far as possible. Can I, can I just jump in? I, I think that's a fantastic point. That if citizens don't take responsibility, and they do things that put themselves at harm or at risk, and then they rely on a safety net they're gonna break the safety net. The system won't be able to cope. And COVID-19 has actually shown citizens that there is a responsibility, socially distancing, making sure they're washing their hands, covering with masks. That is putting in their minds the need for them not to do it. And I think um, what we saw from uh, Dr. Gupta talking about smoking and a smoke-free city, Imagine a smoke-free city, a completely smoke-free city. People are going to see, actually, I've helped myself and I've helped others. So the public health messaging around responsibility for citizens is a very, very big deal. And it's one I think that we need to do much more work on. Yeah, and in fact, just to add to Dr. Hassan's point, I think COVID has also taught that having excellent health infrastructure is not going to be help in any way. For example, the countries. Uh, where they have excellent infrastructures like European countries, US, they are the ones who are also getting even more hard, hard, harshly affected by this COVID pandemic as compared to the developing countries. Again, uh, you have to understand that that infectious disease or communicable disease, because it's not the problem of this developing world, but some like we never anticipated that such kind of problem will be faced with the developed world and the kind of even though they are having excellent health infrastructure they were struggling and they are like we all are like finding it difficult to handle at, at compared to that developing countries where they are like 
slightly better prone to infectious infection. So if you look at that, the coping mechanism in developing countries versus developed countries. So there is a slightly, you can say that is some improvement like, like tuberculosis and other infections like so antibodies and uh, like internal fighting kind of a mechanism has better place in developing countries as compared to developed. So that is also, it is not just having excellent health infrastructure is going to solve the problem. But at the same time, we have to complement each other in such a way that the overall impact will be like a win-win situation. So that is also a very good example of COVID where we have to see that the global scenarios are totally different. If, if I may. Yes, have if I, I, may. I, was, I was wondering why you're quiet for so long Omar, very unlikely. <laughs> no, 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 uh, very, very, very impressive opinions and very informative. And I, I, was, I was reflecting on on what the students are gonna take from this. And we've, we've set the fantastic scene as to how to drive real improvements in healthcare forward. Now, what they're going to need to understand is the challenges that we face in doing this. And I'm sure you all are familiar with the complexities of what we're describing, which is essentially changing people's behavior, change management. There are no universally accepted methodologies that work on the, the different cultures and behaviors that we have. And this is being tackled by technology and in some very sophisticated ways using machine learning algorithms to pick up on our traits, our personalities, etc., and to try and affect change. But these are still extremely nascent technologies and the emerging observations of, of, of those of us in this sort of maybe overarching uh, position are, are two or three. Firstly, attrition on the use of digital technology for changing one's behavior. Typically, we have moments of passion where we will download a new application that we feel will change our lifestyle, that will help us lose weight, that will help us stop smoking, etc. But after a week or two, our moods start to change. And that app suddenly ends up on the fourth or fifth page of our phone, and we stop using it. So real challenge for tech entrepreneurs, how do we keep people engaged with our digital solutions or our messaging, whatever it might be. Gamification is an example, et cetera, et cetera. So first observation. Second, what is the trigger? What is that, that overarching mess message that puts us in that mood to change our life? That is the real complexity around this. A lot of us don't do anything about our health until there's something wrong until we're bleeding or until we feel ill or until we can no longer go about our, our daily activities. How do we create messaging within public health or through social media or through the, me the, the multiple channels we have now to communicate with citizens to really get them over that barrier, to get them to, to make the decision? And then the third, of course, is who pays for all of this? The real challenge is, does the health system pay? Do insurers pay? Insurers may pay because it's going to help reduce their utilization. What about public health services? Is it really them? Is it government level? And when you start examining it, this decision is made very high up. And that bureaucracy and that, that need for evidence and motivation at those levels is extremely complex. And these are the challenges that we currently face as innovators. And those are things that as students, you need to take on board to build into your solutions and to the research that you do. If I may just Brilliant. put it here. Please. From all the, I wish to say that the the health management and uh, public health, in a way, are in direct conflict with each other. Absolutely. That's a major issue, actually. And uh, why people are uh, not engaged into the health management is uh, the the problem trickles right from the top. And I, as I see it in India, it's the industry which influences the political decisions which bring about the changes in the health management many a times as i have seen the infamous tobacco industry uh, interfering in our tobacco control movement and i think the the political will if it is not strong and if it doesn't take the right decisions or is afraid of taking the right decisions we will not be able to achieve a lot also i would say that there is uh, a weakness on the part of both the people who are working in public health, that they do not uh, confront the bureaucracy and the politics, politicians upfront on what is required as a priority. This I have seen very closely in our tobacco control community in India, 
but i also like to hold the people responsible because they know what is right for them why don't they ask for it i mean i must have done over 1000 uh, community awareness programs in last two decades i have always heard from the lay people that if tobacco is this harmful if it is killing people uh, now currently about 4000 adult indians a day why doesn't government stop it so what stops the people from stopping the or uh, letting the forcing the politicians take that decision that is very important issue there is cost effectiveness we have seen we have seen return on investment on spending in the health wellness but why we are unable to do it something which is required to be really resolved i mean i consider that our priorities in the country have always been misplaced we are still developing the tertiary care centers all india institute medical sciences in every institute state i think that is not right we need to really think uh, thread where as to what is our priority and covid has given us that kind of indication in a way we need to really take advantage of that situation absolutely i might i might ask uh, hasan come in i am i'm, I'm going to sound a warning and and this warning i think everyone who's been experienced in health and care for years decades as we can see from the panelists would agree we have an opportunity to do things differently but there's going to be a lot of people in the system that will say well let's just make a slightly more digital version of what we did before just a slightly more a uh, digital wrapper and if we don't take the opportunity now we'll be stuck with the same kind of system with the same problems with perverse incentives which encourages us in the system and also citizens to do the wrong thing we should be thinking what do we do with the potential of digital and technology right now and i'll give you an example this is a uk example um we have gatekeepers uh, we call them general practitioners gps they're family doctors and these gatekeepers are the ones that should be speaking to a patient to see whether they should go into hospital into secondary care and if they say no they'll send you back home with paracetamol and say have some fluid stay at home but if you get through them they will make the referral now that's generally the way of forward there are exceptions now what would happen is they'd make a referral and then many weeks later a specialist would look at the referral and say this is an inappropriate referral there was a big gap there now one way of doing with this slightly more digitally is just to make sure that you have somebody have a phone call like a video consultation where the specialist joins in at that point just to narrow that gap right that's one way of doing it but another way of transforming it would be to think can we use artificial intelligence could we be thinking about risk stratification is this kind of patient at this age with these conditions likely to need hospitalization maybe before they've even seen the family doctor we should be thinking differently and i think that's the opportunity that we have may i, I just yeah. ask a question yes alex yeah please please may i just add to that and i think that that's really important what has always raised because what what it, what tends to happen with with digital it's like people who are really interested in it or have a deep understanding who then try and get it to work then you have the system whatever it is the uh, it, which which is quite happy the way it, the, the the way the way it works uh, at the moment um and one of the big challenges is is rather than see uh, digital or digital approaches as an add on it becomes deeply embedded in the pathway uh, the pathway initially for, for the patient that Hassan has talked about but but wider in the way that we manage all of the access to um our if you like our well-being um our support services and all, all of the prevention but the key thing is it has to be part and parcel of it not just a, just an add on it needs to support um that pathway and i think that's what we don't see um we see lots of projects uh, come up which show that they work and then they fail to make the transition if you like into to the, the mainstream care not just healthcare but the wider care yeah. I, I just so just just, just, want just to bring... take the point uh, sorry can i can i go ahead <laughs> yeah yeah please go ahead please go ahead yeah so just to take the point like what hasan is making and dr gupta uh, dr gupta is making is basically in india what we also have to be have a little flexibility and evidence based decision making just to elaborate that point uh, if you look at this covid situation so the covid situation has put a lot of restrictions on the community research 
like for example face to face interaction has completely been uh, reduced so that has forced us to do like alternative ways and their technology plays a very very significant role like telephonic surveys whatsapp surveys facebook surveys all social media and social networking kind of becoming uh, like a prominent way and people are also expecting even though with all limitations so the target population who's getting access might not be like larger maybe 30% 40% but nowadays this uh, mobile technology and whatsapp has changed significantly and now even in the lowest socio economic group people they are using a smartphone they are using mobile technology so as a part of this covid response so we conducted a survey to understand the covid situation and mental health because we also have the just to elaborate evidence based so as you know like worldwide there is a standard certain symptoms has been recommended like fever cough uh, like sore throat and then basically uh, other symptoms but at the same time we have to see really see whether those symptoms are uniformly working across different sections of the population so in our recent survey which we conducted between july and september it turned out that ki there are certain symptoms like sore throat cold fever uh, might be associated in male but it may may not play that a significant role in female the reason is quite obvious traditionally in india women are used to doing their routine job and activity even though they are suffering from fever even though are suffering from fever so in terms of the mental health so they do not see that as a kind of a very very significant factor as compared to male who are not generally used to go out so they are showing that ki these are the symptoms like as government is provide a guidance guidelines saying that ki fever is a potent potential symptom for covid sore throat is a symptom so they are getting very worried and they are saying that ki they are getting mental stress on those kind of guidelines so with this change in learning we have to have a corrective and like uh, revised guideline which need to be in- integrated and their technology plays a very very significant role in terms of cost effective cost effective way to conducting the research and like disseminating the finding in a larger point right. so that is very very important as dr rakesh gupta was saying may i just pause this discussion just to bring in anil into the because anil you 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 worked across a number of countries and and you you've been at the coal face if you like of the suffering and 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 can you share some of the insights you have based on the discussions we've been having and we'll come back to some of the concepts we've been developing in many parts of the world around population health and and move and bring it all together but i just want to bring you in at this point anil thank you pramod uh, uh, may i take this opportunity uh, to thanks the organizer as well as what a great privilege and honor to be sharing the virtual platform with such an eminent uh, speakers uh, thank you so much uh, let me take couple of minutes just to give a little bit of background to carers worldwide to who we are and what we do then i will uh, answer your question carers worldwide is a uh, international charity established in 2012 it is the only organization exclusively and strategically addressing the needs of family carers up until now you have been talking about the health and uh, but other side of the coin is people who are caring for the sick chronically ill so that is where our focus is what we do is by focusing on uh, achieving recognition support and policy change and we work through local partners to implement carers worldwide model which addresses the holistically so let me define what i mean by family carers family carers are like invisible army of people or individuals who are caring for their relatives or elderly within the family setup um so quite often they are putting their own lives on hold to do so we do not know how many carers are there globally but we can be sure that each one of us in our lifetime on this virtual platform today we will either be a carer or need a care ourselves sometime both so in our experience carers are often isolated and have their own health needs experiences anxiety depression and they are excluded from education workplace and sometimes their role is unrecognized and majority of the caring is done by women 84% of uh, carers we work 
with our women and more than 90% of carers live with economic uncertainty. So we also know that across 37 member countries in OECD, over 10% of adults over 50 years of age take on caring role. Already I mentioned more than two thirds are women with number of male carers are increasing. The majority of long-term care is provided by carers. And at this virtual event, I can assure you at least 20% of you have been or currently a caregiver. We all know someone either personally, socially, professionally who is a carer. And without them, our health and social care system would be faced with increased cost in the billions of dollars, which Professor Samir was talking earlier. The contributions carers make financially, socially, emotionally are invaluable. You cannot put the value on that. Carers are often not recognized or referred to as the invisible backbone of our health and social care system. On behalf of carers worldwide, I'm here to say that no longer must no longer be invisible. I mean, carer's role must not be invisible. So we have come up with a five universal carer's priorities. One is some of those themes we have touched upon. Awareness and recognition is so important, like policies and programs to increase the recognition of uh, central uh, role carers play and well-being of the person they are caring for. And second one is very important is health and well-being, how we can support to carers own physical and mental and emotional mm -hmm. health and well-being and facilitate their social connections and enabling carers to pursue their interest. Third being financial support measures. We need to come up with uh, several measures to support carers financial security and alleviate the pressures on personal finances from caring. Because of caring responsibility, they are losing their employment, unable to continue the work and significant uh, reduction in their family income. And the fourth one being again touched upon, it is so important to have the appropriate information and accessible information and knowledge that will enable and this kind of resources will enable carers to empower and that appropriate to their needs and the stage of their journey. And finally, work and education practices to create a supportive workplace and educational environment so that carers have equal opportunities to remain in and return to work or school. What I'm talking is here, many of young carers or child carers, no fault of their own, they are looking after either siblings or parents. One side we talk about right to education, other side from the system itself, they are missing out vital uh, education. So I will stop there. But very, very, you know, very important sort of uh, aspect of our of our sort of health system, really. You know, because unrecognized, and we focus on health of the individual without looking at the health of the system. And if you want to encourage behavioral change, if you want to bring, you know, a preventive care, we need to be focused on supporting the carer as well as the cared for as part of our, our thinking. And that should be systematized. And, 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 and that's the only way we can also target health inequality. Now, I wanted to, I mean, we, we touched upon how, um, and Dr. Rakesh mentioned how preventive healthcare or public health is, is, is potentially in conflict with where the sort of healthcare system and the healthcare system management currently is. But, but there are, there are uh, many um, uh, parts of the world, including in India, where that's coming together into what's more around population health management to look at outcomes. And I wanted to bring in some of the colleagues. I mean, Alex, you worked on population health. Omar, you do a lot of work around innovation in population health. And I want to use that discussion to then focus back to our key cohort today, which is uh, you know, future leaders in healthcare, and for them to understand where the 
the key challenges in healthcare are. If you want to improve health outcomes, you need to look at the care community, you need to look at prevention, you need to look at population health. What are the opportunities in that? And then we, we may then segue a bit more into the, the technological aspects of it. And Hassan, I might, I might look to you to try and elaborate a bit on that. And we can then really bring about um, something around data and information and actions, you know, and the insight we get from that. So can I can I ask uh, you know maybe Alex to touch upon population health, Alex Omar, and 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 the rest of the panel. We just want you to lead on that. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Omar. Um, I think one of the key, the again, I go back to the comment I made at the very beginning around having a very clear approach of what what we're trying to achieve. Um, um, and then also making sure that we use the data and the information to shape um, the response. Um, the, the phrase often used around what's happened post COVID or during COVID and hopefully soon post COVID um, uh, uh, around um, is, is the word acceleration. Um, and my, my worry is that we're already starting to hear some narrative from some sectors saying, oh, it's fine, once we're past this, we can go back to, back to normal, whatever the phrase that means, or what was happened before. I think it's really, really important that we take what we've learned through this acceleration and make sure it's embedded and, and continue across populations. Point made earlier on as well about and well-being, and my particular interest around mental health and, and, and well-being, it, it is absolutely crucial. It's crucial now, um, uh, as as Anil you said in, in in during COVID, but it's going to be equally crucial um, after um, COVID. And then, how do we make sure that we we monitor that in a structured way? We use an evidence base to 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 shape our learning about the shape our our, 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 our services from the learning from well-being um, and make sure that we, we use that evidence to to shape our services for, for the future. You, you mentioned um, digital. Uh, again, my worry is that um, digital becomes lots of projects and doesn't become embedded into the system and become part and parcel of the way that we, we, we help our populations and um, going forward. And I think and I think it's really important through that approach that will help us to try and stop the inequalities that we're already seeing um, um, develop. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Omar, do you want to come in? Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking, again, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the students' sort of shoes at the moment and think about where this information can be translated into some actionable points for you. And and I think the first thing I do is is not necessarily define population health management but give you some context so we're talking about cohorts of particular disease sufferers so the cardiovascular disease sufferers to an extent we're talking about you know large populations that fall under the particular uh, jurisdiction or budget of of an insurance organization or in the in the in english system um the commissioning groups um and and from there you can sort of develop your community idea of what a population represents um, in practical terms, what population health management looks at, as, as Alex referred to, is utilising evidence, and that's that's typically stuff like healthcare utilisation data. So, ha who's using the health system in a particular population? Why are they using it? How often are they using it? Of course, who isn't using the healthcare system that should be using the healthcare system? And then some of the wider macroeconomic data sets that are available so socioeconomic status um, employment education levels etc cetera, etc cetera. bringing this data together to look at okay now what type of planning or interventions can we make from a organizational or, or, or sort of delivery method that would show us the best return on our investment so to speak so with cardiovascular disease i'll run you through a very quick example to let the other panelists sort of speak on this uh, Northwest London, where I do a lot of work, uh, it was um, established that there was a, a, a rather insignificant intervention that could be made that would lead to a huge financial return and social in return. And the intervention was simply to encourage family doctors, GPs, to regularly test the um, uh, heart rhythm uh, of, of patients in certain cohorts. So those moving on in their late 40s, early 50s, 60s with other comorbidities. 
abnormal heart rhythm or atrial fibrillation can cause a particularly severe type of stroke and that has complications for the patient in their their sort of long-term uh, future uh, uh, existence you know their quality of lifestyle but also huge financial implications to the local health system where often emergency cases people being rushed into hospital to deal with these and the recovery periods afterwards um, could be avoided because it, uh, unfortunately and the stuff that was known before there are sort of um, indicators that can be picked up relatively easily by the GP and a, and a very reasonably priced medication that these patients could be put on to avoid all of these um, uh, uh, further repercussions. The way that this was all put together was the evidence was established based on appropriate population modeling. What is the propensity for particular patients to suffer from these particular diseases? And what I want to state here is that the evidence fell under three buckets clinical, financial, and human factors. So there was real appropriate modeling done on all of these three areas. And the, the procurement of the solution was made centrally and pushed down towards GPs. And the implications have been recorded over the last few years and they have exceeded what was expected. As a simple example of population health management, this is where you need to think about how you can utilize technology, lobbying, leadership, um, uh, you know, uh, influencing your clinical uh, colleagues to try and make those shifts and changes. And I, I sort of leave that as an example. Yeah. And, and that sort of brings the focus on prevention, isn't it? Early, early, early self-management prevention, that behavioral change. Absolutely. So, so, in, in so context, that in a way, no, no, yeah, no, that in a way breaks the dichotomy, isn't it, between sort of yeah. preventive healthcare and tr curative healthcare. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so I just, I mean, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, to take the Omar's point forward, I think we can, like, we already have demonstrated this by conducting a randomized control trial intervention in India over the span of 20 years in one of the least developed states in India, that is Bihar. So, just to give an example and how the global data sets are very, very essential in terms of your planning, where to focus, what is the problem, identifying the problem. For example, there is a global tobacco surveillance system which is uh, the data is available almost all WHO signatory countries, almost 169 countries, where on an average, like annual to three to five years surveys has been conducted and India become member of that part into early 2000. And that is the first time where we are started getting national level data for tobacco problem among school children. And when I'm talking about school children, that is 12 to 15 years or 13 to 15 year children. And that is the first time when national data was made available in India as a part of that survey. And that survey provided some striking finding which we as a public health researcher never anticipated. Just to give an example, some of the northeastern state, some of the Hindi speaking state where tobacco use prevalence at 13 to 15 year age group was more than 50 percent. And the, the state is Bihar where it was almost 80 percent. So as a part of that, like as an India dynamic, like as you know, like we are culturally and traditionally following and teacher uh, for children, the teacher is a role model. So on that ground, so we col collaborated with CDS and WHO and encouraged them to conduct a survey in the same school with the teachers as well. And there is a perfect correlation, the state where tobacco use prevalence among 13 to 15 year children was higher, the same state the tobacco use prevalence among teachers was also higher. And just to give an example, in Bihar, the tobacco use prevalence among school teachers was also 80%. Okay, and then we started right. understanding right. what is the tobacco dynamic. And that is where we thought that, okay, that is one of the least developed state compared to uh, in, within India. So we decided if we can do some kind of developed intervention in this part of the world, and if we sustain that and made a model out of it, so that can be scalable and sustainable across India. And that's mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. we develop an intervention. But again, you have to see what is the optimal impact? So you may have to identify the appropriate target audience. So there we found if we provide some intervention to teachers, so that will have impact not only on teachers, but also on future generations like children. And at the same time, the teacher also plays a significant role in the community as well, because India traditionally teacher is considered as a role model and True. their behavior has a significant impact on other other person's behavior also. So there, what we did, we first developed an intervention. We demonstrated that 
at, at the end of the intervention, 50% teacher quit tobacco, but there we were focusing only on 100 schools. Then we saw that ki, it, it is not a scalable model. So we decided to integrate that program in the education department. So instead of <laughs> training headmaster, we decided to train cluster coordinator. Why cluster coordinator? Because each cluster coordinator is responsible for 10 to 15 schools. So if we train one cluster coordinator, it get transferred to 10 to 15 schools. And that yeah. model was found to be effective. And again, that dissemination implementation and again, the more delivery of intervention was done by the cluster coordinator instead of we doing that intervention. And now we are taking as a logical next step that we are using technology in that part. So instead of now we in-person training, we are introducing mobile app as a part of mm -hmm. that. And now we are instead of testing that only in Bihar, we are taking that model to Madhya Pradesh where the language and tobacco prevalence Brilliant. was more or less similar and we are planning to integrate other risk factors of NCD also in addition to tobacco. So that is how like we can scale up the model and we use the technology to our advantage and take it forward. So that is why like it is very, very essential that we have to work innovatively. Brilliant, brilliant. Now that we are segmented into innovation, uh, from the point of view of, of majority of our cohort who are the sort of leaders and need to understand innovation, understand opportunities for career in innovation. I'd like to focus on that. Hassan, do you want to kick off by just explaining where do you see the opportunities and also a little bit about the different, um, what we mean by digital health? Um, absolutely, would love to. Um, I think digital health is a very confusing phrase. I, and I've gone all over the world and I keep hearing different definitions. And one of the first questions I'm asked is what is digital health? So I, I don't want to dismiss the question. I, I do want to give an answer, but I want you all, whoever's listening to not worry because in my eyes, the broadest definition is best. And in the sense that digital health is any use of data and technology for the use of healthcare. We can, we can narrow it down and I think there are a lot of conversations. So in the States, when people talk about digital health, a lot of the time they'll mean the wearables, they'll mean the things that the consumer's using. But there's a broader definition around it. And I think that's where we should stick to because actually naming the thing is less useful than what the thing is used for. How it's used is the key. And that's what we've got to focus on. So whether you use digital health using AI and machine learning, whether you're using robotic process automation, in the end, are you trying to speed up the time between a stroke and the patient coming into hospital? That's the thing that we've got to focus on. So let's worry less about the thing and worry more about the needs. Um, I think the opportunity in population health, actually, let me talk about a problem that we have in population health. Um, the first problem is we've been reacting just waiting for people to come in. We now want to be proactive, we wanna go out. But how do we find the sweet spot for the population size where we can still make a big impact, where there'll be economies of scale, where it's not gonna to be too big for our teams of clinicians to collaborate, but we'll still be small enough to offer a personalized level of care. So identifying the population size is actually a big deal. In England, we've come up with an answer in primary care of between 30,000 and 50,000 population size, which we call the primary care home. And the National Association of Primary Care have been instrumental in doing that. So imagine that you're looking at 40,000 patient size. Now you know that you bring your resources together to try and deal with it. That's the right level that we found in the UK. It may be very, very different in India, and it may be different in different states. Maharashtra may be very different to Bihar. So you have to come up with an answer on the number. And when you do, all of your technology have to deal with how do you gather your resources together? How do you collect data on the outcomes for those patients? And how do you make something which is a continuous loop where you learn from what you've just done you change your practice and then do it again. And that continuous loop, the infinite loop of learning, what we call a closed loop, that's the way population health works. So any innovation that helps that closed loop, that learning, that's what we want. And anything that just seems to say, hey, we've done something great, and it doesn't add to the learning, you have to be very careful of. And I think that's what I'm looking for. When I look for technology, and I'm up against the Israelis and the Swiss and the Dutch when I go around the world looking for technology. 
I'm looking for things that help that close loop. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a couple of questions just to, just to throw in to the panel. One question is, what all changes India as a country should make when it comes to healthcare and medicine post-COVID to be better prepared in the future? And I know we have touched upon some of that, but, but you know, I'll invite comments from, from the panel on that. Dr. Rakesh, yeah, do you think... want to go first? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I would consider that, yes, COVID has given us an opportunity, but uh, even regardless of COVID, what is most important uh, for the country is that, and especially for the audience that we have of the health management, people, uh, students, it is the individual which makes the changes. And where it requires actually is the commitment, the consistency, and also your compassion to bring a change. That I think is most important aspect. You have to take a considered decision and then go for it. My experience is that uh, people and communities are very welcoming. They like what you do as a good thing. If you are a good doer, they will always welcome you. You do not require huge funds. You do not require too many uh, associations or you don't have to have a large data or the research findings with you. They love the basic small researches, their participation. And if you give them that information and engage them into it, then they would go for it if they see their benefit into it. So I consider that, yes, we need to have the health managers who are really well driven from within that this is what is required and can be done it should be done and it can be done and it can be done with a very small budget so uh, that would be my message to the students here as well and also to bring a change and one has to be flexible as to what you do i fully agree and i am totally for uh, the involvement of the technology as well but i think it is the individual which will make the change and i consider mental health as very important so to my young friends, I would say that don't make profession as your life. The profession is part of your life. Live a good life, but also lead a life which is a considered, uh, based on considered decision. I will, I will ask for each and every person's takeaway message for our future leaders towards the end. We'll do some questions. So, yeah, who, who else wants to jump in? Omar? If I may, yes, sort of building building on that point, if I may take the technological component rather than the sort of a, a, a absolutely agreeable position on lifestyle, I think that India should focus on developing and learning internationally from innovation ecosystems. And I know Samaya is doing this particularly well, but I think there is benefit in joining all the components of healthcare, the provider, the patient, the financiers, the technologists, the, the layman, uh, the legal teams, whoever it might be, and bringing them together under one umbrella. This is where we make real insightful technological advances, whether they are the latest gadget or just, have we thought about doing this job slightly differently? When we have everybody's input in a well-structured format, where everybody understands a similar language, that's where we see start to see really big developments. And I've, I've had the privilege of being part of these in, in London and globally, and I'm I'm a full proponent for them, and I think it's 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 a good use of people's time to become involved in these processes. Brilliant, Hassan, Anil, Raju, Mangesh, everybody's coming in. I'll I'll, I'll, <laughs> and, I'll be I, quick. I want to I want yes Sorry. please please do please do no take your time. Um, I, I'll I'll be quick. I, I think we um, if I was going to give some advice to my Indian friends and colleagues it would be not to make the same mistakes, not to repeat the same mistakes that other nations have, have made on their journey. And here, here's the problem. Other industries are actually ahead of healthcare. What we see from banking and fintech and retail is better than what we see in healthcare, especially in terms of the patient experience. So the obvious thing to think about is, why do we make such a big difference between health and mental health to the patient. They're just doctors that are gonna help me, right? And we've got to make that something that is seamless to the patients, to citizens, that they can come and access help and we'll help them. Because if we silo mental health and keep it separate, then someone who has cancer will, will develop mental health problems typically. 
there's going to be some real anxiety for them. Do we refer them to a separate doctor? Now there's two different doctors, different hospitals even. Looking at them, the data doesn't um, translate across and they've got two different selves. We need to find a way to help make it seamless and frictionless. Now I know that's incredibly difficult for any nation, especially one with the, the breadth of the problem that India is facing. But that's where we have to go. Look at what others have done right and follow other industries. That's my advice. And, and if I may just add one more point to that question is that, you know, a lot of people in India won't have any health insurance cover. So that also adds to anxiety. So how, you know, if you add that into the mix of the population, that different health needs and the, and the solutions, I guess, for the way or the way ahead, there are no solutions, there's only a way ahead. How would you so from, how would you articulate that, Mangesh? Yeah. Yeah. So Pramod, I think that is a related point. I would just want to say that we have to make sure that in India we have a win-win partnership between private sector and government sector, because they have to complement each other in terms of there are certain advantage of the private sector, but there are certain additional advantage of government sector in terms of the scaling up implementation but at the same time resources are more driven by the private sector as compared to the government sector so that is one area we have to partner and there should be a sensitization in terms of the trans uh, information transition for example in covid situation you might have also learned there was a complete havoc at the beginning like it seemed that key, all covid uh, solution should be provided by the government infrastructure where there was not adequate inf uh, infrastructure available and all the government infrastructure where the adequate equipment and infrastructure were available but they were left like with uh, no clear guidelines how, how they can complement how they can play a specific role so there should be a clear win-win kind of public private partnership should happen in terms of overall health improvement and i i personally feel like as a researcher when i started what the understanding about advocacy and sensitization so media plays a very very important role as you mm. might have seen mm. that overall globally media has played a very very significant role in terms of the providing right and wrong information to the population so that's the reason where i feel when i say wrong information because they wanted to make a breaking news so that they can have a like PRP advantages. So at the same time, we have to make sure that key, how best we can constructively use media for sensitization as well as for making awareness program. So that is where that will Absolutely. also make a very, and, and we as a researcher has to learn to make media as a partner on the health sector rather than just making sure that, okay, they, are, they will be interested in cancer day, diabetes day, and other day, rather than mm. it should be a kind of a dedicated kind of like a, a time available in the media. So that will also make a significant impact according to me. Brilliant. Just Anil, uh, yeah. Can I see? Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let, yeah. yeah. Uh, taking a clue from the uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, COVID uh, caseload, uh, you know, uh, as far as Maharashtra is concerned, uh, it, it was worsely affected uh, by the uh, COVID cases and the uh, cases as well as the toll. I mean, the health system capacity, public and private uh, jointly couldn't cope up with for a, a period of one month or so. That, uh, that was the scenario. So the public-private co collaboration and is, is a, uh, I mean, uh, need of the hour. I don't deny that. But having said that, we have to uh, I mean, uh, protect the financial risk of the end user. And having said that, mm -hmm. government of Maharashtra could, uh, I mean, put the caps on the rates of the private hospitals. And they could extend the state-sponsored health insurance scheme to those who were, who were actually excluded. Means in Maharashtra, uh, yellow ration card holders and the orange ration card holders are the eligible candidates for this state-sponsored health insurance. The white ration card holders were not. But during this crisis, they included white ration card holders also to, I mean, minimize the financial risk uh, for, to these guys. I mean, this yeah. help in uh, better PPP and the the the, uh, the lesson learned in the process is that we have to do differently to, to see that we optimize the available health resources, be it bed, be it uh, I mean the diagnostic facilities or all other sectors. So you cannot have uh, compartmentalization like this is public and this is private and this is, uh, I mean, insurance and this is not insured. The insurance is likely to have un uh, unwanted care, unnecessary care. The uh, public uh, sector likely to have uh, minimum care, bare minimum care. All these conflicts need a balancing act. That's the lesson out of it. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Anil, do you want to come in quickly? And I want yeah. to do, yeah, please do. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. Just I want to make a three quick uh, observations and uh, points from Kero's point of view. Uh, my first point is um, uh, to health management professionals who are on this virtual platform. I would like to urge and uh, make them think about please include carers' health and well being. It is so crucial and it is so vital empowerment of carers. And the role played by the carers is so crucial and recognize that role. Uh, in the West, there is a greater recognition is there. NHS recognize triangle of care. One side professionals, another side is the patient and third one is the role played by the carers. It is so crucial. Uh, so, whereas in India, most of the caring is done by the family carers and uh, recognizing that role and uh, appreciating the wonderful role they are playing is so, so important and also including their health and well-being is also important. That is the first point. And the second point is, I think it is uh, important to bring in a uh, multi-stakeholder approach. Some of you uh, on this uh, platform have spoken about. I would like to bring in academic institutes as well so that there is a significant amount of research is being done and published in the high impact journals, as well as there are so many philanthropists out there. It is time for us to make a case to invest in these kinds of uh, uh, research, whether it is uh, trust and foundations or philanthropists and the government, how could, that is what Carers Worldwide has been promoting at a state level, multi-stakeholder forums. We are bringing in all the domain uh, experts uh, onto the platform, including the academics and donors, as well as the government. And my final uh, comment is to the service providers, carers are the catalyst, turning the treatment plan into realities. And, uh, they may not have gone to universities, but they are the expert by experience. Can we recognize that? Can we appreciate that? Mm -hmm. And it is so important to include, as you know that uh, WHO has done a research on long-term care and they published a report. By 2030, there is going to be 400% increase in the need for caregivers, particularly in low and middle income countries. What I'm trying to say is we are literally sitting on a bubble we don't know when that bubble is going to burst. So it is time, all of us, to mm. include carer, empower carer, recognize the wonderful role they are playing and provide appropriate information and knowledge so that they are ready, not only to look after the patient whom they are caring, but also improving their own health and well-being. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Anil. There's one topic that I would like us to quickly focus in a, in a few minutes, but and, and then I just wanted 30 seconds of each person's time to give some advice to our healthcare management cohort, you know, our students on 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 advice and opportunities for the future. What should they focus on? So, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Mangesh, you you mentioned about hugely unutilized sets of data, and Alex, and you know, Hassan, we always talk about. What's the point of data? Data needs to be about insights and about impact. So, and, and really, you know, the second part of the conference in March is an opportunity for the healthcare management students to work with organizations like Helix and maybe work with all of us to try and, you know, create pro projects and do poster presentations, you know. Uh, so Dr. Mangesh, you want to just talk about data briefly and then I'll move to Alex and then 30 seconds each. And then that would be our end of time. Yes, yes. In, in fact, yes, that is a perfect time. Uh, Mr. Anil also has mentioned about the research and high impact journal publication. So that is very, very essential. In terms of the publication productivity, India is not up to the mark of most of the developed country or USA. So that is where, but at the same time, it does not mean that we are running short of data. We are sitting on the wealth of data, like even if you consider all hospitals, uh, National Family Health Survey data, census data, uh, national survey like global tobacco global surveys like global adult tobacco survey nutrition surveys and these when i am this i am talking about all public domain data 
so this data are available on public domain or like through appropriate sources they have to approach people and there is a plenty of opportunities available for students or health professionals like even students can start from their respect like somaya college somaya medical college is there so i think somaya college also can encourage their student to use the data available in the clinic there is there are ways anonymously data can be analyzed can be published without identifying from where the source is but that is very very essential uh like for example there is a, in mumbai uh, like we have bmc mortality date cause of death data is available and that is available uh, when i say that available it is almost 1 lakh death per year so that is the amount of data is available in within mumbai with uh, bmc corporation and it will be it, it should be utilized for uh, making reports and for planning purpose and with this platform uh, i i am just on behalf of heli secretary institute for public health which is primarily healthcare research organization so any students or any researchers who wanted to do any kind of data analysis wanted to use our existing data you can access our website uh, some of the projects and want to work on publication for their national conferences uh, in solar collaboration with uh, somaya or even in the like a larger international conferences please send an email to us our scientific team will be very happy to help you brilliant thank you very much Alex, quickly on 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 information. As you say, you don't like to use the word data. You like to use information, right? Yes, I think my my advice would be to take that data and convert that into information. Information that you can use, and then use that information to make the changes to the system or whatever system, what approach you're taking, and use that information uh, to constantly monitor um, the improvement. I think. I mean, jumping on to to my advice is, I think the focus should be on improvement, and then use whatever tools are available to move to move in that direction. Alex, can I start with you, Alex, and ask you to give some tips for the students from the management program on career opportunities and any other general advice? Yeah, thirty seconds each. Certainly. Well, uh, uh, reflecting back on 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 uh, the comment earlier on about the the shortage of of people in healthcare. I think there'll always be an, uh, an opportunity to to improve and to help people. Um, I think it's really important through your careers to have a set of values that transfer across whatever jurisdiction you work, whatever system you work in, um, and those values uh, are, 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 should be, I think, around improvement, um, around excellence in whatever you you do, and in, uh, absolutely about uh, outcomes for patients and outcomes for people. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Career opportunities. You said, you said broadly, there's a the whole, whole, whole ecosystem is open for opportunities. Yes. Um, Any particular specific? Yes. Uh, uh, um, I, I know we people think we've overused the phrase digital healthcare, but I think it, it's really, it's the application of that care, not necessarily uh, developing. I think a lot of development has, has been done, but the application of that healthcare and embedding them within um, health <clears throat> and care systems uh, to support people is really important. Um, uh, one of the big challenges I think people have globally is is good operational management and mm-hmm. operations within um, health systems and health services. Um, uh, I think the third thing is is those people who will really achieve are those who can balance the financial needs with the clinical needs uh, and with the operational needs. That 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 triangle, if you like, of operations. Um, or the clinical need and the financial need are the ones who, who, who can, can keep that balance in mind and, can, and use that through their careers mm-hmm. and who will, will probably have a bit of success. Brilliant. Thank you, Alex. May I go to Dr. Rajiv? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, uh, there are, as uh, discussed during the course, I mean, there are many uh, inbuilt controversies in the uh, health system as such. I mean, there's the preventive dimension, promotive dimension against curative dimension. The, I mean, uh, and the home-based care and uh, the institutional care. That there is supply-side financing in health as well as demand-side financing of health. I mean, uh, the determinants of the health and the curative aspects of the that one has to do a balancing act. There is a public health sector. There is a private health sector. So all these markets, as as Umar has mentioned, there are many stakeholders in the health system, and there there uh, uh, there appears to be, I mean, uh, interests and the objectives are different. Having said that, 
uh, how can we build a, a common thread among these and mm -hmm. forward? That's the key. And the uh, COVID has uh, emphasized this point. And then okay. that's why, I mean, uh, there are many career opportunities. We are in inf information era now. Information is a public good. Having said that, we should be, I mean, after the information, uh, uh, uninformed person is just like, uh, I mean, uh, a poor person in the uh, community. So uh, we can't afford to be uninformed and un uh, unliterate, illiterate about the health technology. Thank you. So information carrier, we need to enrich. Omar, you're on mute. Mute, quick. Couple yeah, of thank you. Tips. So very, a very quick one. I, I think um, picking up on where people have left off. The Italians are known for their fashion sense, the Brits for their stiff upper lip, the Indians are known for their ingenuity. I would suggest you focus on your capabilities and ingenuity. And I heard a phrase many years ago, don't fall in love with the solution, fall in love with the problem. Focus all of your energy on the needs. Use that information that Alex was talking about and then use your ingenuity. I have seen the best technology from India, the cheapest, most efficient. Keep going. You're on the right path. Yeah, so that's that's for Riddle also to try and engage with the students and work with the different parts of the Somaya ecosystem and Helix and other partners. Hassan, next to you. Okay, um, a quick one and, and some great answers. It's knowing the system. And, and this is because some people, this is what you should not do. Some people focus on tech, build a lovely thing, and then try and find someone to buy it, right? And, and they just walk around saying, oh, I've got this great tech, it should solve your problems. It's called blockchain. And no one's worked out how to bring it into healthcare. What I think has been really, really great from great entrepreneurs and innovators is that they've lived in the system on the ground level. They've been porters or they've been nurses or they've been social workers or they've been carers. And because they have a real genuine look at what's going on, then when they go find the tech for it, they do it from a place of understanding. Be that person. Don't be the person that chases all of this technology. Learn what is going on in your health system. Anil, over to you next. It's just on my screen order, so there's no other particular order here. <laughs> No problem. I think uh, 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 great uh, uh, questions and suggestions and uh, uh, wonderful, uh, inspiring thoughts there. So two quick uh, suggestions from me side. Uh, mine uh, is one is I think coming decade is going to um, be significant for the caring sector, whole social care and uh, uh, caring sector. So I would encourage health professionals, health management uh, students to think that what are the kinds of solution which uh, or whether it is tech or different kinds of approach to simple technology can empower carers so that that can have the direct impact on the health and well-being of the person needing the care. That is uh, one. And uh, my second uh, uh, suggestion is going to be uh, to Somaya uh, Institute and all, all the health uh, sector, most of the curriculum, whether it is a medical or nursing curriculum is, is entirely focused on patient, not on the carers. Even the professionals themselves are caring. You have seen this pandemic has really had a huge impact on burnout of so many nurses, so many health professionals. It is so important to include into the curriculum uh, a module on support to the carers or even the professionals. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Very well said. Mangesh, over to you. And then finally, Dr. Rakesh. You're on mute. Uh, yeah. So here I would like to uh, remind the point which uh, Samir Somaya has mentioned about like so far traditionally in India academics and research go parallel. So this is required now to be integrated and student plays a very significant role. They should not hesitate to take out of comfort zone research topic, find their suitable guide and do innovative research and contribute. And at the same time, 
uh, from the uh, institute point of view, we have to encourage young researchers to do research and continue teaching also. So that has to go together and uh, faculties has to set examples for the children or uh, young, young, young researchers to do that mm -hmm. activity in the future. So that is one thing I would like very, very happy. And for that, I will be very happy to help Somaya College also and any like-minded researcher through Elis uh, uh, Sex Institute for Public Health. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, Dr. Rakesh? Uh, I'll be very specific uh, about uh, delivery of tobacco cessation through the health services. Because even if we are able to uh, effectively address one risk factor in the NCDs, it is something which is easily doable because you don't require anything except your commitment to provide and deliver the tobacco cessation services. We have infrastructure, we have staff. So I would consider the health managers can look into this aspect uh, in a very comprehensive manner. And it's easy to empower people, easy to deliver. And that will help us immensely in reducing one of the lifestyle related risk factors. Uh, overall, I would say that, yes, it's important that uh, I consider individuals bring changes and therefore it's very important that all that we have all said, they can get the gist out of it and think as to what is required to be done or what can he or she do and do it. That is most important. I'll end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and that was very much the point we started with. Isn't it? It's Ramod, about Ramod, can, I, can I intervene for a time being? Of, of course, please. Yeah. Yeah, I was going so, to pass on to you and Monica yeah, anyway. Exactly. So the uh, panel discussion is going on in a very, very interesting mode. And we have covered so many different aspects of healthcare sector, health system, uh, carers viewpoint, uh, and public healthcare systems and public private partnerships. I think we have touched upon so many aspects. And our director, Monica Khanna, has been listening very, very patiently. So I would like her to give some comments on the panel discussion. Perfect. Thank you. I don't think this was part of the agenda. No, it was not. It was not. It, it is not part of the agenda. It, it, it is. It is always part of the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've been listening with real uh, interest. I mean, this is something uh, you know, learning from the uh, uh, looking, listening to the words from uh, you know the experts in the various fields. I mean, it's been a very thought-provoking uh, discussion. I think our young students, uh, for them, uh, building uh, healthcare management as a career, I think there are so many aspects and so many dimensions to it. And uh, as in, a, you know, uh, I think the healthcare sector, especially in India, I think it's crying for professional interventions. And, uh, you know, through all these uh, words of wisdom and, you know, the training that we're giving them, the exposure that we're giving them, I think this will go a long way in, uh, uh, you know, bringing a lot of professionalism into the healthcare system. At the same time, I think there's a huge scope for, uh, you know, for uh, innovations. And especially with India, I think low cost innovation is the, uh, you know, the order of the day. I think like, uh, you know, we have a person, he's on our academic advisory board. So he said, you know, that India is poor in many aspects. But one thing that we are very rich in is in problems. So we have we are rich in problems, and so you know there are so many possible solutions. I think True. these are the opportunities that we all and the youngsters should be looking at. Another thing I do believe is the integration of uh, healthcare systems uh, between the rural and the urban areas, and within the urban areas, I think it's between the poor and the you know, the privileged and the poor, let's call it that way, you know. So, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, generally we keep chatting around, you know, with our maids and all. And uh, so, you know, when the, after the lockdown, we were getting the maids back home. I, we are privileged in India to have maids at home. And uh, so we were a little uh, scared, skeptical. But, uh, you know, the, what the maid said, she said, I don't have health insurance. And that's the reason why I'm more careful, you know. So I, I, you know, one of you, the uh, members were saying that in India, the I think the uh, uh, the uh, the number of recoveries or 
the country we have been able to control the pandemic to a large extent i think that's also because of the fear factor or the scare that you don't have the healthcare insurance and all these things so if you land up in the hospital you have to spend so much money they don't have it so they they are more careful you know they are more careful absolutely i think there are various dimensions that have come up for the students i think they should be spoiled for choice as to what aspects they should focus on you know in the careers and all but great opportunities and i am really uh, very impressed with all this and i think we should all work together uh, to you know in the future along with us young fresh minds and come up with lot of innovative solutions i think there's a great future in healthcare management thank you yeah. so much this is what i have absolutely so prema punam anybody ajaya anybody else wants to uh, comment So I, I may go back to some of the yeah yeah no go on prema no please yeah. please go so on. what i feel is that there are so many various aspects which we are covered that individually each aspect also requires a detailed discussion later on yeah. so yes it has given us a very broad background and uh, shown the vastness of the opportunities as well as problems but i think each and every element of that can be discussed further and we can have more such sessions on deliberation on each and every topic maybe in near future so that is yeah. that is going to in help us in, in fact dr prema no. so that might form a platform for our topics for conference absolutely Because there are like broad yeah. topics for the conference absolutely absolutely yeah. i think there are so many threads Brilliant. which are emerging they will be very very useful for bringing up new research project new research papers for uh -huh. our students as well as for faculty and we know now what are the sources for where whom to talk to when we are stumbling against something so uh, i think this has become a very good resource for us as a management program healthcare management Brilliant. Program. Brilliant. if i may also make a comment you know firstly you know the diversity we touched upon the diversity of the of the panel you know vast experience in in, in you know global vast global experience and it's about you know making solutions for local needs based on a global outlook Okay. um so and, and that all sort of distills down into into a few key messages really one the opportunity in every aspect of the health and care and wellness ecosystem is there you know and the opportunities are growing but as alex was saying there's three parts of it that we need to look at we need to look at the finance because the money is not necessarily growing we need to manage quality we need to be efficient have the have excellence but look at the financial aspects of it so and have the right values you know about the experience of the person you know um, so that's the set of values and dr rakesh mangesh we all touched upon that personal commitment that passion so if you have the values the passion the opportunities are immense mm -hmm. and each part of the sector is open for 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 impact you know for that that's the ultimate goal of all of us here is to have an impact so we can reduce some of those health inequalities we can we can make population feel more secure you know your point about your maid monica people feel more secure and that helps them be more productive to the society um so so really thank you thank you very much again for this opportunity and thank you to all the panel members you know really fantastic insights and we could as i said we could sit here all day and go on for weeks and weeks without ending this discussion but we may have to subsection it and and re reconvene at some point in the future yeah. so thank you thank you from from me thank you i think you know so uh, pramod may i make a suggestion may i make a suggestion yeah. of course yeah you can I make an you order you can make an order my panel discussion <laughs> <laughs> it's an order. The next panel discussion should be on frugal, frugal innovations and uh, fantastic innovations. You know, frugal and which is very beneficial to the society at large. I think India is crying for all these things. You know, we really need all these things. So let's uh, I, I, make I, just an open call. Absolutely. I'm no. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm no. And again, that that's where that's where we need to look at what has the most impact for society and bring in. you know the panel members including 
the the real expertise of people like Anil, who who speak from the heart and 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 has you know a, a way of looking strategically at what might be a solution. So anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you to the students to host and manage all the chat and questions and and coordinating so, everything. So, thank you, so, Pramod. So, thank you. So Pramod, I think Dr. Pema. So do, are there any one or two questions from the participant, or like we are like closing the session? Uh, uh, I think some of Indeed. the questions, yeah, some of the questions were taken already. Uh, they were okay. sent uh, by our student POC to Dr. Pramod, but uh, yeah. I, I can ask uh, student POC. Uh, are there any additional questions? No. I think yeah. I think they have. Been okay, covered. that's very good. No, because no, otherwise, like the questions we, were covered. Pa pa uh, participants should not feel that we were being told to raise the question, and our questions are not answered. No, no, we, we picked up on the questions as much as was relevant for this panel. Diksha has been very good at screening and collating and sending it through. Thank you, Diksha. To thank you. Thank you, sir. So, thank you, So, thank you, Premaji. Thank, thank you, Pramod, for. Thank you so thank much. Thank you all. Pramaji. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. You just ask the uh, anchors to take thank the. Thank you, so one small aspect of the last part is remaining. So we want to announce the winners of the case study competition, uh, which we are taking today morning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Who, who so, is the lucky guy or lucky girl? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Moving on. Uh, mm -hmm. So Samavish 2021, the annual flagship event of MBA Healthcare Management at KJSOMA Institute of Management was organized today as well. So this year marks its third edition. It was a national level business case study competition focused on healthcare challenges and real life business problems. It was an opportunity for B school students across the country to promote in a, to compete in a live case study on Aerox Technologies Private Limited, a pioneer and leader in, in oxygen generators, and to present their findings before the esteemed jury consisting of Mr. Sanjay Jaswal, MD at Aerox Technologies, Mr. Arup Majumdar, and Dr. Lalit Dabolkar. Now we would like to call upon Dr. Varsha Parkema, Dean of KJ Samaya Medical College Hospital and Research Center, to please announce the winners of the competition. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to attend today's uh, deliberations and so many points came out of it. And I'm really looking forward to the next part where we'll be presenting a lot of research papers in the conference. So now I'm sure the uh, students must be waiting for the results. So first I would like to announce the runner-up. The runner-up is team elite group from the college IMI New Delhi and the names of the students are Jinki Sharma, Shiv Banga and Adhiru Gupta. Congratulations, Dean. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I would request Thanks the a lot, team, uh, to use the backdrop which was available already to you people for the digital documentation. Yeah. yeah, and uh, the winners are, the name of the team is Shark in Suit, college name is EAPMI Manipan, the names of the students are Dhruv Bonagiri, Sayani Mukherjee, and Siddharth Kashyap. Congratulations. So, uh, they are the winners. But I, I would like to congratulate all the teams who have participated because I'm sure they must have worked very hard for the competition. So congratulations to each and everyone. Uh, I request the PR team to put the spotlight on the winners and runner-ups for the digital documentation. And I request the winners to use the backdrop which was available, made available to them. Uh, could you just give us a, uh, a few seconds to just get Yeah, that? yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, you can laugh. Yeah, you are the winner. 
surprise that congratulations thank you really a great event really loved it everything is so great and so greatly managed thank you thank you for the opportunity sir mm-hmm. ma'am all the respected people we have been listening to you for quite some time and it would be great if we have listened to you before the event before we have submitted our case thank you to all the panelists and the organizing team also i hope you like the case and uh, we also like the presentations of yours and uh, you. today it got stretched by a little bit and i also appreciate appreciate your ap- uh, patience as well uh, because there was a good conversation going on yeah, thank you everyone anujan shreya see you can start yeah all right Congratulations to team Shocks and Suits and team Elite Group. We would also like to thank all of the other teams for their enthusiastic participation. And uh, it is now time to announce the second phase of our first international healthcare conference, the research paper presentation. Over to Dr. Jaya Mathew ma'am, coordinator uh, of MBA Healthcare Management Program. Good evening. Now we have come to the end of the first phase of international healthcare conference. It was indeed a meaningful discussion. Now it's my privilege to brief you about the second phase of the conference, which is scheduled to be held on March 27th, 2021. This year we are focusing on the theme future of healthcare post COVID-19. The conference will provide a platform for the participants. to present their research findings moreover the selected research papers presented at the conference will be considered for publication in the peer reviewed and reputed journals the asia pacific journal of health management apjhm indexed by scopus has agreed to bring out a special issue based on selected papers apjhm is now included in the directory of open access journals too and business perspectives and research bpr our institute's journal which is also indexed by scopus will also publish a few selected papers we look forward to your active participation and valuable valuable contribution to the conference thank you thank you ma'am we are already excited for march and we hope so are you all I would now like to request Dr. Poonam Chauhan, ma'am, co-coordinator of the MB Healthcare Management Program, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, thank you, Anuja. Respected panel members, Dr. Pramod Prabhakaran, Alex Lewix, Omar Bhatt, Anil Patil, Hasan Chaudhary, sir, Dr. Pedneker, Dr. Raju Chotkar, Dr. Rakesh Gupta, dignitaries and colleagues. Thank you for taking out your precious time and improving our exposure and knowledge about contribution of technology in our lifestyle and health and well-being. Also, how we can make healthcare more affordable, accessible, and inclusive. Hoping to be more ingenious about it. Let's hope for that. My special thanks to our very own board member and advisor for our conference, Dr. Prabhun Prabhakaran sir, for take, making this program. truly international by bringing global healthcare experts as panel and leading the discussion i thank our chancellor shri sami sumaya sir vice chancellor v n rajshekharan pillai sir for the constant encouragement and support and our director dr monika khanna madam for inspiring us to raise our bar and supporting at every step to make this happen today i thank our scientific knowledge partners hls sexaria institute of public health KJ Somaya Hospital and Research Center and MDSA my sincere thanks to Meera ma'am Shalja Dumal our program officer and our IT infrastructure team led by Subhash Mayur Freeman Rahul and Mahesh thank you guys greatly appreciate the healthcare management student volunteer team ably led by Ankit Verma who worked tirelessly to make this event possible myself and dr jaya mathew are proud to be part of the vibrant team of healthcare management coordinators headed by dynamic dr prema basargekar who leads by example 
She has diligently worked together to bring the diverse collaborations and panelists as, and we have just begun a lot more to be achieved in the coming months for our research conference on 27th February, 2021. Sincere thanks to all my faculty colleagues who have joined and have been part of this whole event. Special thanks to our participating organizations today, MGM Institute of Medical Science and Biomedical Science, Institute of Chemical Technology, MIT World Peace University of Pharmacy, Tata Institute of Social Science, Association of Healthcare Management Professionals. Thank you everybody for joining us and let's hope to see you again on 27th February. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. With, with this, I think we come to an end of today's event. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. It was a pleasure indeed to host all of you today. We have finally come to the end of this event. We look forward to seeing you in March. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Good night and goodbye.